Is that better? Okay. Welcome, welcome. Uh, my name is Angela Gole. I will be your MC tonight. Thank you for coming. And before I get into introductions, I would like to just have a few uh, housekeeping items, so I'd like to be quick. Um, first of all, most of you should have gotten the email, but tomorrow's start time has moved up. It's at 11 o'clock, and the registration will be at 10. And that you should have gotten that information several times over. If you didn't, that's why I'm mentioning it now. Um, bathrooms, there's one for anybody who needs it um, that is handicapped in an assistance. It's a one-person bathroom in the back. And then both sides, there's bathrooms. And there's also bathrooms downstairs in the parish hall, OK? Um, emergency exits, basically the, the very end. And these doors on both sides of me here are emergency exits as well. Um, I want to explain about the Q&A cards. OK, how we're going to do it, because we have so many people and we have a little bit of a limited time. We're not having an open mic Q&A. We're doing Q&A cards. You may not see them at the end. We'll, we'll try and pass more out. Um, you can look for them. They're, they should be at the ends of your pews. Um, you know, if you can't find a card and you want to just use a piece of paper, yeah, a little note card, you can do that too. So what's going to happen is during the talks, think of your question. Every person is given one question per speaker, OK? And so each of you basically gets two questions, one for Mr. Owen, one for Father Ripperger. At the end, I'll come back up here and announce that we're going to be having um, the pickup of all the Q&A cards. And you'll see friendly volunteers coming up and down the aisles, then uh, picking up all the Q&A cards, OK? So then just pass them down to the end, and we'll pick them up. And then the speakers are going to do three and three and three and three. So first, Mr. Owen will go, and he'll do three. He'll pick out three. And then Father Ripper will go, he'll do three, and we'll go back and forth till we run out of time. And then with the leftover questions, I'm going to let them review them, and they might answer some of those questions tomorrow. So you might still get some of those questions answered tomorrow if they're not answered tonight. Okay? And one thing you know is putting on a conference like this does um, cost money for the parish and everything. We would like to ask you for free will donations. We didn't want to stop anybody by coming by putting a price tag on it. But we would definitely ask you, please be generous with your free will donations. 100% of all of the money that comes in goes to the speakers and the church. Those of us who organized don't get a penny of it. It's all for the speakers and the church. And we would like to send them off with a very generous donation, please. Um, and of course, if you want to write out um, a check, obviously cash is very welcome. But if you'd like to write out a check, um, the Colbe Center, K-O-L-B-E. Uh, Colby Center is for Mr. Owen, St. John the Evangelist, of course, the parish, and S as in Sam, M as in Mary, D as in Delta, is Father Ripperger's organization. Okay, and that's, he shortened it up. It's Latin, it's very long, so it's much nicer as SMD. Please, no food and drink. Um, we just need to say that because there is beverages and food in the basement in the um, parish hall. So... Um, you can feel free to have that at any time if you eat it down there, but we would ask that nobody brings any food or drink upstairs. Okay, and then at the very end <clears throat> of the night, we will have a survey. You see them at the ends of the pews. Again, um, please fill that out at the very end for uh, both speakers, and the, it's five questions per survey. Okay? Oh, a little closer. Oh, okay, there we go. I hope I don't have to repeat anything. It wasn't important. <laughs> OK. Uh, let's see. Oh, and there will be people uh, walking around with survey boxes. So you can put the surveys in. You'll see them. And you put the surveys in the survey boxes, and that, that will work. OK? OK. So on behalf of the three apostolate sponsors in our host parish, I'd like to thank you all for coming once again. Our sponsors are Catholics United for the Faith spearheaded by Alan Margot Shoves, the apostolate of Our Lady of Good Success, founded by Dan and Kathy Heckenkamp, and Ave Maristella Group, Doug and Angela Gold, founded by Doug and Angela Gold. And I'd like to thank all of the founders and board members of these groups who work together to bring this seminar to you. And we would like to thank Father Michael Merkt and the staff of St. John the Evangelist Parish for their diligent and tireless work in hosting our seminar this it was a lot of work, and we really are so grateful for you coming, and so we're thankful for the parish for hosting So in this beautiful church. We're very grateful to have it here. 
And before introducing our first speaker, I'd like to announce that, as you know from our emails, we did lose a speaker from the event this weekend. Um, she, Pam, Miss Pamela Acker, will not be speaking this weekend due to an emergency health condition. And we ask for your prayers for her at this time, for her full recovery. Okay. Um, and also, the free seminar link, the early bird registration, um, they will be received after the conference because of this issue. She's the one who does that seminar. And so in order to finish it, we have to wait till she's well enough. So that will go to everybody who registered on April 1st or before. And of course, only the emails that we have on, um, in our system for those who registered. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. And actually, but actually one more thing. Before I say that, our, our two talks tonight and tomorrow, my Mr. Owen and Father Ripperger go hand in glove. They really go together, and their message is very similar, but they're very different talks. So I would just keep that in mind, that the, these talks, are it's very important to hear both in order to get the full message. So our first presenter is Mr. Hugh Owen. He is a convert to the Catholic faith and the son of Sir David Owen, who was a former Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, and former Secretary General of International Planned Parenthood Federation. Hugh attended Princeton University, where at the age of 18, he was baptized, confirmed, and made his first Holy Communion in the Princeton University Chapel on the Easter Vigil of 1972. Hugh's wife, Maria, was a member of the first class of women at Princeton. She and Hugh were married in 1973, they have nine children and 19 grandchildren, and one of their daughters is a postulant with the Benedictines of Mary. Hugh received a bachelor's with honors, a BA with honors in history from New York University, and an MS in education and supervision and administration from Bank Street College of Education in New York City. He also received a permanent license to be a principal or superintendent of schools in the state of New York. <clears throat> For the past 25 years, Hugh has dedicated his life to service of the church as a writer, editor, teacher, and lecturer. He has been published or interviewed by such notable organizations as LifeSite News, Latin Mass Magazine, Home Life International, I'm sorry, Human Life International, and the Social Justice Review, just to name a few. For the past 23 years, he has served as the director of the Colbe Center for the Study of Creation, which he founded in Mount Jackson, Virginia. He was recently made a member of the newly founded John Paul II Academy for Human Life and Family. This is his third seminar in Wisconsin, including a total of eight talks around the state. Please welcome Mr. Hugh Owen. We'll just start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. O Mary conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. In the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Well, it's a great joy to be with you, and our subject for the next two days is a very important one creation-based natural science versus evolution-based scientism. And this is our agenda for my talks over the next two days. We begin by recognizing that a science is an organized body of knowledge and that theology is the queen of the sciences, the science of God based on divine revelation. We are going to see that according to divine revelation, the whole work of creation from beginning to end was supernatural. And therefore, creation is a proper subject for theology and not for natural science. 
we'll see that natural science is or ought to be concerned with the natures and interrelationships of created things, not with their origins. And we'll see that when natural scientists work within the framework laid down by Catholic theology, their work flourishes. But when they overstep their bounds and embrace materialism and naturalism, we will see that their science is perverted and descends into scientism. A scientism which can be and is being used to establish an anti-Christian totalitarian order throughout the world. So let me begin by telling you a little bit about myself. This is a picture of me with my father taken a few years ago. <laughs> my father was the son of a Baptist minister in Wales. But when my dad went to university, he went to university in England, which was much more progressive. And so his professors enlightened him and they said, we don't need the fairy tales in the book of Genesis anymore because science can explain everything. Evolution can explain the origins of man and the universe without God and without any supernatural agency. And so like millions of people then and now, my dad was completely robbed of his faith in Christianity and became a secular humanist. Being an idealistic person, he went to work for the United Nations at the very beginning and he became an assistant secretary general, co-administrator of the United Nations Development Program. And after 25 years, he was knighted by the queen, who just died, and retired. But when he retired, he was disillusioned because he looked at the world and he saw that all the problems of the world were much worse than when the United Nations was started. Why was that? Well, once again, he turned to the intelligentsia that he knew, and they had the answer, the wrong answer, but they were sure that it was the right answer. They said the reason the United Nations is not making any headway in solving the world's problems is it's not going to the root of all the world's problems, overpopulation. That's why we have wars and pollution and economic and social injustice. Cut down on the number of people, they said, then we'll have enough to go around, all our problems will be solved. And so my dad accepted to become the first ever Secretary General of IPPF at the very time when IPPF changed its position on abortion and became the world's number one provider of abortion as well as contraception and sex education. And he held that position for just about a year when he died unexpectedly of a heart attack in London when I was just 16 years old. Now I don't have the time to tell you about my conversion in detail, or why I'm convinced that at the last moment our Lord gave my opportunity, the opportunity to see the truth about his life and to repent, and why I believe that as he went down into the depths of purgatory, he began to pray for me. But what is certain is that his death precipitated my conversion to the Catholic faith. Because although I had been brought up with no Bible, no prayer, no church, or anything of the kind, Less than two years after my father's death, I was baptized, confirmed, and made my first Holy Communion as a Catholic in the Princeton University Chapel where I was enrolled as a freshman. At that time, the chaplain for the Catholic students at Princeton was a Jesuit priest. And he gave me a book so that I could learn the doctrines of the Catholic faith. Maybe you've heard of it, the Dutch Catechism. But we call it the Dutch Cataclysm because this is the book that has practically annihilated the Catholic faith in the Netherlands, which once had a vibrant Catholic community that sent a disproportionate number of missionaries all over the world, including here, who gave their lives to spread the true faith, like Father Theodore Vandenbroek, who did so much for the Catholics here in Wisconsin. And there's a theme that runs through the Dutch cataclysm, and this is it. We live in a scientific age, and science has enlightened us so we can understand everything in our faith in a new and deeper way. Sounds great, but then Father Schillebex and company proceed to sow doubt in the mind of the reader about everything from the existence of angels, the historical reality of Adam and Eve, 
the virgin birth, the bodily resurrection of Jesus, the intrinsic evil of contraception, and on and on. It's a miracle that I survived the Dutch cataclysm and came into the church at all. But somewhere in the depths of my soul, I knew that it is not possible for sound science to learn anything that is true that would contradict any teaching of faith or morals that was handed down from the apostles. And I was delighted to eventually discover that at the very time that my father was being robbed of his faith because there was nobody in his environment to give him the other side of the story about evolution, St. Maximilian Kolbe, next slide, was writing articles in his journals and sending them all over the world showing that the emperor of evolution was not wearing any clothes, that there actually wasn't any sound scientific evidence for this idea that molecules came alive and turned into human bodies over hundreds of millions of years of the same kinds of material processes that are going on now. And so with the support of our pastor, in the Jubilee year 2000, we founded the Kolbe Center for the Study of Creation to provide a forum for Catholic theologians, philosophers, and natural scientists who defend the traditional teaching of the Catholic Church on creation. So what is the traditional teaching of the Church on creation? Well, our friend Bishop Athanasius Schneider never tires of saying that one of the most wonderful summaries of the dogmas of the faith ever written is the Catechism of the Council of Trent, the Roman Catechism. And that is certainly true because this catechism was written at the height of the Protestant Revolution so that pastors all over the world could give their people very clear, precise definitions of all the dogmas of the faith. It was the gold standard for teaching and preaching the dogmas of the faith in the entire world for 350 years. It's still authoritative. It's the only catechism that's quoted in the new catechism. It's quoted 20 times because it gives such beautiful, precise definitions of all the principal dogmas. So if you go online and look up the Roman catechism and go to the first article of the creed, you will see how this magnificent catechism defines the dogma of creation. Here it is. The divinity created all things in the beginning, not just a few things that turned into everything else over billions of years. The dogma is the divinity created all things in the beginning. He spoke and they were made. He commanded and they were created. There was no natural process. And if you read on, St. Charles Borromeo and his co-authors will tell you that this is how God created everything. This is how he created all the different kinds of plants. This is how he created the heavenly bodies. This is how he created all the different kinds of animals. And this is how he created Adam, body and soul, and Eve from Adam's side. And the Catechism of Trent tells every pastor in the world, if you want to teach your people how God created the heavens and the earth and the seas and all they contain, all you have to do is refer to what? Go ahead, three slides, Karen, I'm so sorry. You refer to the sacred history of Genesis and just teach that to your people. Now, next slide. Unfortunately, all over the world today, so many of our young people are being told that, yes, most of the fathers, they took Genesis as a historical account of how God created the world and what happened in the first period of human history. But there's that great exception, St. Augustine. He didn't take Genesis literally, so we can use him to accommodate all the modern scientific theories of evolution. That is completely false. If you read what St. Augustine actually wrote, you will know very well that he would have shed his last drop of blood for the literal historical truth of every word in the sacred history of Genesis, just like all the other fathers and doctors would. 
The only point on which he differed from the overwhelming majority of the fathers was on the meaning of day in Genesis 1, because he did not have a perfect translation of Genesis. He had the Vetus Latina, he didn't have St. Jerome's Vulgate translation, and in the Vetus Latina, it seems that there would be a contradiction between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 if you take the days of Genesis 1 literally as sequential 24-hour days. In St. Jerome's translation, there's no contradiction. And in the literal interpretation of Genesis, St. Augustine says, the narrative in Genesis is not written in a literary style proper to allegory, but from beginning to end in a style proper to history, as in the books of Kings. So for St. Augustine, Genesis is a historical book. It's the word of God. So every fact that is related, that Adam was 930 years old, is a fact which is sealed by God himself. And he would have shed his last drop of blood to defend the literal historical truth of every fact contained in the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. Now, the Catechism of Trent also made sure that every Catholic in the entire world understood this. And this is probably the most important truth that I'm going to reaffirm to you in, the, in these two days. Every Catholic was taught that when God finished creating Adam, body and soul, and Eve from Adam's side on the sixth day of creation, he placed them as the king and queen of a perfectly beautiful, complete and harmonious universe that was totally free, not only from human death, but from deformity, disease, or any disorder of that kind. And then he stopped creating new kinds of creatures because he created everything for us. And therefore, the Catechism of Trent says that he instituted the Sabbath because the entire work of creation was finished. And they refer the pastors of the church to Exodus because that is where we learn that God, with the finger of God, wrote the Ten Commandments on tablets of stone. And only one of those commandments includes the command to remember. He says, remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. Six days you should work. The seventh day you must give to me. Because in six days... God created the heavens and the earth and the seas and all they contain and rested from the work of creation on the seventh day. So why did God create the world in six days according to the Catechism of Trent? He could have created it in 50 trillion years, in 30 seconds, in an instant, as St. Augustine believed because of the contradiction that he thought was there between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. The reason that God created everything in six days and consecrated the seventh day is because he's a loving father. And by the very way that he created the world, he gave us the rhythm that we have to live by if we want to live a happy, healthy, holy life. And he did it from the very beginning of the world. And St. Augustine speaks for all the fathers when he constantly reaffirms the fact that that entire six-day creation was supernatural. Here in the city of God, he is talking about the creation of Eve from Adam's side. Listen to what he says. He says the creation of Eve he did as God. Some people use the standards of their own daily experience to measure the power and wisdom of God. Next slide and uh, next and the next one. There we are. Thank you very much. Forgive me. The devil <laughs> hates this message and he attacks our technology everywhere we go. But we are not going to let him win. So bear with me. He goes on to say, 
And so they regard the account of man's creation as fable, not fact. And because the first created works are beyond their experience, they adopt a skeptical attitude. So St. Augustine is saying, God revealed to us how he created the world when there were no human witnesses. And he has revealed to us, and the church has affirmed it from the beginning, that the entire work of creation was supernatural. We do not see women coming out of the side of men. But St. Augustine says, we are not to doubt for one second that the first woman, St. Eve, was created literally from Adam's side because that is what God revealed. But he says, if you judge God's revelation of how he created the world according to what we see in our natural order of things, you will get the wrong answer every time. And you will think that God's revelation in Genesis is a fable when actually it's a fact. Next slide. Now all the fathers of the church and the catechism of Trent also taught with one voice that God created for us a perfectly beautiful, complete and harmonious universe. But when St. Adam committed the original sin, there was a divine judgment on the entire universe, not just on the earth. And the entire universe was made subject to a mysterious bondage to decay. That's Romans 8. Because this is not a speck of dust in a vast universe. This is the spiritual capital of the entire universe. And the original sin that took place here affected the entire creation. And so all the fathers and doctors and the Catechism of Trent agree with St. Augustine in the City of God, next slide, that in this creation had no one sinned, the world would have been filled and beautified with nature's good without exception. But my brothers and sisters, I could weep in front of that tabernacle from morning till night because most of our young people all over the world are not being taught this. They are being taught that God created the world that we see with death, deformity, disease, and struggle for existence. And we're going to see that that is the principal reason why we have a mass exodus of young people out of the Catholic Church. Next slide. In reality, this beautiful doctrine gave to the church and the world the most wonderful framework for doing scientific and medical research. It gives us a lawful universe of well-designed creatures marred but not ruined by the effects of original sin. Next slide. Whose form and function but not their origins can be discovered through rational investigation. The church also gave to natural scientists and medical researchers the most wonderful tools for investigating the natural world in the philosophy of Aristotle. Because Aristotle understood that if you really want to know something, you must know it in terms of its causes. Let me illustrate with an example. This is the Pietà of Michelangelo. The material cause, next slide, <laughs> thank you, Karen. The material cause is the material of which the thing is made, in, in which case, in this case, the marble of which the pieta is made. The efficient cause is the agent that produces the thing, in, which, in this case, the chisel in the hand of Michelangelo. The formal cause is very important. It's the way all the material elements of the thing are organized to make it that particular kind of thing. And that's why you can make a pieta out of plastic or rubber or marble and you can always tell what it is. And then the final cause is the purpose for which the thing exists, which in this case would be to inspire devotion to our Lord and the Blessed Virgin in their sufferings and sorrows that they endured for us. 
Now, this philosophy of Aristotle was so thoroughly incorporated into the intellectual life of the church that it even gets incorporated into definitions of dogmas of the faith. For example, in 1312, the Ecumenical Council of Vienne defined dogmatically that the human soul is the form of the human body. Well, we just did a quick review of Aristotle, so you know what that means. It means that it is not your brain that is coordinating all the organs and systems of your body. It is your soul. And as long as this definition was understood in the framework of the traditional Catholic doctrine of creation, no Catholic doctor in the entire world would declare somebody dead until everything had shut down. Because it's your soul that is the form of your entire body. But when the molecules to man hypothesis became the consensus view in natural science, even among Catholic intellectuals, and the geniuses at Harvard University wanted to do transplantation with organs that cannot be taken from a dead body because they will disintegrate the moment that the person is dead. They came up with the idea of brain death because according to the hypothesis of evolution, what differentiated us from the subhuman primates, according to them, our cousins, was some marvelous mutations that took place in our brain. And so it's, if it's our brain that makes us human, and our brain stops functioning at an optimal level, well, you might as well declare us dead. And so, my brothers and sisters, in Catholic hospitals all over the world, there are people with a heart, normal heartbeat, pulse, normal body temperature, passing urine, exchanging gas through the lungs, who because an electroencephalogram shows that the electrical activity in their brain has dropped below a certain level, are declared dead. And they are murdered in our own hospitals by having their organs taken out of their bodies while they are alive. And this abomination would never have begun and would not be taking place if we had been faithful to the traditional Catholic doctrine of creation and maintained the traditional philosophy of Aristotle in the church. Now, even outside of the Catholic church, in countries that were devastated by the Protestant Revolution, the greatest scientists continued to work within the framework that they had inherited from the Catholic Church. For example, Sir William Harvey in Protestant England, next slide, oh, there he is, thank you, was the first human being in recorded history to accurately describe the working of the circulatory system in the human body. And when he was asked how he made this discovery, next slide, he said he just asked himself, why would the valves and the chambers, the veins and the arteries, why would they all be designed the way that they are? And with that as his starting point, assuming stable form and function, he formulated a hypothesis, he tested it, confirmed it, and that's how we knew for the first time how the circulatory system works in the human body. Well, the devil has always hated this doctrine because he knows that anyone who believes this fundamental doctrine of creation knows that God created for us a perfectly beautiful, complete, and harmonious world, completely free not only from human death, but from deformity, disease, or any disorder of that kind. The devil doesn't want us to believe that. He wants us to make God responsible for all these evils. Next slide. And so, Almighty God had to inspire our first pope almost 2,000 years ago to warn us against the future revolution against this fundamental doctrine. It's one of the most amazing Prophecies in the entire Bible, 2 Peter chapter 3. 
where St. Peter says that in the last days, far in the future, scoffers will come into the church, mocking the word of God in Genesis and saying, back up one, please, and saying, things have always been the same since the beginning of the universe. Now, what does that mean? This is extremely important. It means that these scoffers are going to say the same material processes that are going on now have been operating in the same way from the very beginning of the universe. Does everybody follow that? But this would be like somebody at Cana taking the miraculous wine that our Lord just changed from water into wine. And it would be like the person saying, it's more reasonable to explain that this wine came to be through a natural process. I don't think that would be very reasonable, do you? And so St. Peter goes on to say that these scoffers, when they arise, are going to have to deliberately ignore the fact, not the pious belief, that it was the word of God that brought the heavens and the earth and all they contain into existence. Not a material process like a supernova explosion. And here's where St. Peter's prediction begins to be fulfilled. Next slide. Not with Darwin, but with the so-called Enlightenment philosophers. René Descartes is the first baptized Catholic scoffer to begin to be taken seriously when after leaving Catholic France for free-thinking Netherlands, after leading a very immoral life, especially against the Sixth Commandment, after dabbling in the occult, Rosicrucianism, he admitted that he had three mystical dreams in which a spirit of truth possessed him and put him on the path to develop a wonderful new way of thinking that would change the way everybody thought. And one of those wonderful new ideas that some spirit from hell put into the mind of Rene Descartes was this, that it's more reasonable to explain the origins of things in nature, next slide, in terms of the same material processes that are going on now instead of this strange idea that things just popped into existence in the beginning. Well, Descartes' works were put on the index of forbidden books because every theologian worth his salt in the entire world knew that that is not reasonable. It is not reasonable to attempt to explain what God himself told you was supernatural in terms of natural processes. That's not reasonable at all. And Blaise Pascal was every bit as great a genius as René Descartes. But unlike René Descartes, Blaise Pascal actually loved our Lord Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church. And he saw that if Descartes' false philosophy were ever widely accepted, it would do untold harm to humanity. And so in his work, Pensee, he says this amazing prophetic statement. He says, I cannot forgive Descartes. In all his philosophy, he did his best to dispense with God. Oh, he could not avoid making him set the world in motion with a flip of his thumb, the Big Bang, if you will. After that, he had no more use for God. Isn't that amazing? Pascal saw, if you assume that the same material processes that are going on right now have been operating in the same way from the very beginning of the universe, what do you need God for? All you need God for then is to start everything going. Then you can forget about him. Because if things have always been the same, then we can just study the universe as, is, as it is now and extrapolate all the way back to the beginning and we can figure it out all for ourselves. We don't need any revelation from God. And that brings us to the second wave of the revolution against 
divine revelation's account of creation. It's not time for Darwin yet. Now we need the geologists. Charles Lyell in England, James Hutton in Scotland, they embrace this false philosophy of Descartes and Immanuel Kant and Spinoza and the Enlightenment philosophers, that things have always been the same, and they decide that they are going to destroy, this is Lyell's explicit intent as he describes it in his notebooks, they are going to destroy people's faith in the mosaic account of the flood by reinterpreting all the rocks on the earth in terms of Descartes' false philosophy, that things have always been the same, therefore the present is the key to the past. And so these men, not having any facilities for doing real experimental research in the field of sedimentology like we have today, imagined that sedimentary rocks formed like this. Next slide. Uh, tap the uh, key a couple of times. They imagined that great bodies of water came over the land, sediment settled out of the water, the waters withdrew, the sediment hardened into rock, and then that happened over and over and over again over eons of time. We know, and I'll prove it to you tomorrow, that with cutting-edge empirical research, we know that this is not how sedimentary rocks are formed in the real world. But they didn't know that. And so they imagined that when you look at the great sedimentary rock formations all over the earth, like this in the Grand Canyon, of course you would assume that the part of the formation at the top formed recently, and that part of it at the bottom, that must have formed eons ago. And if that were true, and it isn't, then, of course, the fossils in the rocks would seem to tell the story of life developing from the simpler to the more complex, from the fish to the amphibian to the reptile to the bird to the mammal and finally to man, and that is how we get Darwin. Darwin says, right in Origin of Species, if you do not accept Lyell's book on geology, you might as well close mine because his wild speculations in biology are completely based on Lyell's wild speculations in geology, which are totally based on Descartes' false philosophy that he got from the spirit of truth, alias some demon from hell. It's a house of cards. But that is how we get the tree of death, which adorns the biology textbooks in Catholic schools and universities all over the world. And not only is this, I'm sorry, a move ahead, and again, and again. Not only is this diagram a total misrepresentation of the history of life, an accurate diagram would be an orchard of life. And we'll see more about that tomorrow. But if we're going to say that this is what God did, at least the people who say this should be honest enough to call this the tree of death. Because if this is true, it took the God little e G of evolution 550 plus million years of death and destruction so he could finally make the human beings that he wanted to make. Now this man was the most successful salesman for Darwin's pseudoscientific hypothesis. And I am going to prove to you that he is the man most responsible for deceiving a host of brilliant Catholic intellectuals into thinking that there was such solid evidence for the microbe to man evolution hypothesis that they had to reconcile the Catholic faith with evolution. But even Heckel admitted at the end of his life that for a long time the church leadership completely rejected these ideas. The Pope, when Darwin published Origin of Species, next slide, was blessed Pope Pius IX. And when a French doctor wrote a scathing critique of Darwin's Origin of Species, the Pope was so pleased with it that he published a public commendation 
of this critique, and he said these words in that published commendation. He, the Pope said, evolution is a system which is so repugnant at once to history, to the tradition of all the peoples, to exact science, to observe facts, and even to reason herself. It would seem to need no refutation, did not alienation from God and the leaning toward materialism due to depravity eagerly seek a support in all this tissue of fables. Remember what St. Augustine said? He said, if people judge God's revelation of how he created the world according to the standards of the natural world, they're going to say it's a fable. But what does blessed Pope Pius IX say? He says, Genesis is the fact. Evolution is the fable. And he was right. And heaven said, Amen. Because did you know that there has only been one approved apparition of the Blessed Virgin Mary in the entire history of the United States? Of course you know, because it happened here in Wisconsin. But did you know that Our Lady appeared to Adele Breeze, an 18-year-old Belgian immigrant, here in your beloved Wisconsin, six weeks before Darwin published Origin of Species. And the Blessed Mother gave Adele a commission. She said, teach the children their catechism. Because there were thousands of Catholic children running around like savages who didn't know anything about their faith. Well, as you probably know, the bishops in Synod had met in Baltimore in 1852 and mandated that a catechism be written so that every Catholic in the United States would learn the faith in the same way. And they said, this catechism must be modeled on the catechism of St. Robert Bellarmine. Next slide. Well, St. Robert Bellarmine's catechism categorically taught what the Catechism of Trent taught, that God created everything in six days supernaturally and consecrated the seventh day when the work of creation was done. Next slide. But St. Robert also made a very important equation. Next slide. He pointed out that there are mysteries in the New Testament, which God has revealed, which we can only believe on his authority. And there are mysteries in the Old Testament, which we can also only believe on his authority. And he makes the point that you must accept them both if your faith is going to be coherent. For example, St. Robert points out that there was nothing in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary that had any potential to produce a man. So he points out that the only reason we know that God became man in the womb of a virgin is because God revealed it to us and we believe it on God's authority. But St. Robert goes on to say that it's exactly the same with his revelation in Genesis. God tells us that on the third day of creation week, he willed every kind of plant to spring up from the ground when there were no seeds in the ground. There is no way that that happened through any natural process. And St. Robert says, you must believe what God revealed about how he created the world with the same degree of faith by which you believe that God became man in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary or your faith is incoherent. And this is why we have a mass exodus of young people out of the Catholic Church because for at least 50 or 60 years, we've been telling them that we believe God became man in the womb of a virgin because God revealed it Oh, but what God revealed over here, we only believe that if the consensus view in human science gives the stamp of approval. So what do the young people conclude? 
It's the consensus view in human science that is the ultimate authority because it gets to pass judgment on the word of God as it was believed in the church from the beginning. And if you read the writings of your beloved Bishop Venerable Frederick Baraga, you'll find he gives the teaching of St. Robert Bellarmine word for word. Next slide. And so the Baltimore Catechism was mandated for use in every diocese in the entire United States, right up to Vatican II, and it taught every Catholic in the entire country that God created everything in six days by simply willing it into existence. And now I want to ask you two questions. Question number one. When Our Lady came down to your beloved Wisconsin, and she told Adele Breeze to teach the children their catechism. Did the Blessed, Vir Blessed Virgin Mary know how and over what period of time God created the world? Of course she did. She had the beatific vision, and what she knew in the beatific vision was the same thing that she learned on the lap of St. Anne from the sacred history of Genesis. Well, here's my second question. Would the mother of God and would our Lord Jesus Christ tell anyone in the church to teach anything that was not true? And would God allow his church to teach that his revelation in Genesis is to be accepted as he gave it to us from the very beginning of the church practically until now, and of course it's still on the books, would the Blessed Mother and God allow us to be taught something that was false? It's impossible. Well, Blessed Pope Pius IX was very alarmed because he saw that more and more Catholic intellectuals were being infected with Enlightenment thinking. So he convened the first Vatican Council, and 10 years after Darwin's Origin of Species was published, this council handed down a very important anathema. If anyone says that it is possible that to the dogmas declared by the church, a meaning must sometimes be attributed according to the progress of science, different from that which the church has understood and understands, let him be anathema. My brothers and sisters, this means that there is nothing that we are ever going to learn that is true in any area of natural science, be it astronomy, geology, biology, or anything else, that will contradict the dogma of creation as it was understood at that moment. And we know how it was understood, because at the moment that anathema was handed down, the Catechism of Trent was mandated for teaching and preaching the faith in the entire world. Pope Leo XIII had exactly the same view as Blessed Pope Pius IX. And during his pontificate in 1878, the Congregation of the Index of Forbidden Books, as an arm of the magisterium, examined a new work by a theologian named Caverni, and the thesis of his book was, quote, it is possible to reconcile evolution with Christian doctrine, unquote. And what was the verdict of the theologians of the Congregation of the Index when it was an arm of the magisterium? No, it is not possible, because in the words of Cardinal Ziliara, quote, with his system, Darwin destroys the foundations of revelation and openly teaches pantheism and abject materialism. Meanwhile, every little boy and girl in the entire world was happily being told that God created the whole world for them in six days and that all the bad things in the world came not because God used them to make us, but because of sin. But what's really amazing is we go all over the world and we hear very highly educated Catholics, brilliant scholars, dismiss what every Catholic in the world was taught until very recently with arguments like this. 
And Father Stanley Yaki, may he rest in peace, was one of those brilliant minds that used this argument. You can't have days without the sun. Genesis 1 tells us there was no sun until the fourth day. Therefore, the days of Genesis 1 cannot be taken literally. Meanwhile, the little flower and any nine-year-old child in the entire world could have explained to Father Yaki why that objection does not hold water. Because when she was probably eight or nine years old, she had to learn this. Question, why were the sun, moon, and stars not created until the fourth day? In other words, why did God create this light on the first day which alternated with darkness to create the day-night cycle and then on the fourth day create the sun? Well, she made her parents very happy because, of course, she learned the answer, which was they were not created until the fourth day to teach man that they are not the authors of the productions of the earth. God wished thereby to prevent idolatry. Think about it. God gave Adam the revelation of how he created the world. As long as the subsequent generations remembered that revelation, they would never fall into idolatry. But what happened was most groups of people lost the revelation from God. That's why the second time around, God wrote it in tablets of stone and told us in a commandment to remember it forever. And so what did they do? When they forgot God's revelation, they saw that all life depends on the sun. And what did they do? They began to worship the sun. And they even offered human sacrifice to the sun as a god. Weren't they doing that in Mexico until Our Lady of Guadalupe came and liberated them? So Almighty God had a very good reason for creating everything the way that he did. And if we maintained that revelation, we would never fall into idolatry. Now Pope Leo XIII was very disturbed because one of the things that the Freemasons and the communists and other enemies of God were trying to do was to destroy the foundations of Catholic society by introducing legal divorce into Catholic countries like Italy where it was prohibited by law. And so he wrote an entire encyclical, Arcanum Divine, on holy marriage. And he tells the bishops of the whole world, you must defend holy marriage on this foundation. And then he writes these words. He says, we record what is known to all and cannot be denied by anyone that God on the sixth day of creation, having made man from the slime of the earth and having breathed into his face the breath of life, gave him a companion whom he miraculously took from the side of Adam when he was locked in sleep. So he says, you are never going to be able to successfully defend holy marriage unless you teach that God instituted marriage by the very way that he created the first human beings one man, body, and soul for one woman that he created from the body of the first man, one man for one woman for life from the beginning of creation. But St. Pius X succeeded Leo XIII, and he saw that in spite of all the efforts of blessed Pope Pius IX and Leo XIII to combat these errors, a whole host of Catholic intellectuals were thumbing their nose at the teaching authority of the church. And so the Pope announced in his encyclical Pascendi, we now have in the church the worst heresy in the history of Christianity, modernism. And he identifies the principal doctrine of modernism as what? Evolution. Now why is this? Why is it the worst heresy? Because every other his, heresy in history added something, subtracted something, twisted a few things, but left most of the faith intact. Pope St. Pius X saw modernism is different. Because modernism is based on the premise that everything is changing, everything is evolving. So we saw if these people get control, they will destroy everything. 
because they're going to say, look, the liturgy that was good 500 years ago, the marriage law that was good, the moral doctrines that were good, they're not good for us anymore because we've evolved into a new situation. And if you listen to people like Father James Martin, this is their mantra. Everything's got to change because we've evolved. And in that very same year, Pope St. Pius X had to condemn with the full weight of his office this proposition, quote, they are free from all blame who treat lightly the condemnations passed by the sacred congregation of the index. Why did he have to do that? Because all over the Western world, he saw Catholic intellectuals showing contempt to the condemnation of 1878. And right close by to here was one of the leading ones, Father John Augustine Zem at Notre Dame University. A brilliant intellectual, a man with vast knowledge of the natural science as well as theology, and yet in complete contempt of the Congregation of the Index, in 1890 he published a book called Evolution and Dogma in which he said there is now so much evidence for the microorganism to man evolution hypothesis that we simply have to reconcile the Catholic faith with evolution. And if you read his book, you will find that the number one proof that he gives is this, the drawings of the German anatomist Ernst Haeckel, who drew a human embryo, copied it, and said that that was the embryo of the fish, the pig, the turtle, the chicken, and the salamander at the same stage of development. Now, Haeckel was exposed as a fraud by his own academic peers. But instead of being booted out of academia, which is what should have happened, he just slightly modified his drawings, kept them essentially the same, and they went into the biology textbooks where they remain to this day, as I will prove to you in a moment. And what this drawing, these drawings purported to show was that human beings in the mother's womb go through all the stages of evolution. These drawings made it seem that humans in the womb go through a fish stage when we have gills, an amphibian stage, a reptile stage when we have a vestigial tail, and then only finally reach the human stage. And so my brothers and sisters, back up one slide, please. We can draw a direct line from that terrible day at the beginning of the 20th century when Notre Dame became a flagship for teaching theistic evolution, and that even more terrible day a hundred years later when Barack Obama, the most pro-abortion political leader in the entire world, walked on stage at Notre Dame and got an honorary degree while the real Catholics were being handcuffed and taken down to the local armory, not even allowed to protest this abomination. Because without the acceptance of evolution at the beginning of the 20th century, which denigrated the sacred humanity of the unborn child from the moment of conception, there would never have been an honorary degree for Barack Obama at the beginning of the 21st century. And my brothers and sisters, this is what Ernst Haeckel called Dar uh, evolution's greatest triumph. Not when a monkey turned into a man, but when the Catholic intellectuals decided that they had to reconcile the Catholic faith with evolution. That's what he calls evolution's greatest triumph. Well, in 1950, Pope Pius XII published the last authoritative document from the Magisterium on evolution. And I have heard prominent Catholic intellectuals like Dr. Ken Miller at Brown University tell students with Humani Generis, the Pope allowed Catholics to believe and teach evolution. Nothing could be farther from the truth. If you read the encyclical for yourself, you'll see that the Pope tells the bishops, you must teach that everything in the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis is true history. He tells them you must teach that every word in the Bible is true, whether it is talking about faith, morals, history, natural science, or anything else. 
The only permission that he gives is for Catholic experts to examine the evidence for and against the evolutionary hypothesis in light of the deposit of faith. And the problem is, next slide, the Pope has not been obeyed. 73 years later, there has never been an open, honest debate between the champions of theistic evolution and the defenders of the traditional Catholic doctrine of creation. And when that debate finally takes place, evolution is finished because it only survives by censorship and intimidation. Nine years after Humanity Generous, next slide. This man, Sir Julian Huxley, was the foremost scientist, evolutionist, atheist in the entire world. My father knew him personally. He was very involved with the United Nations. And because it was the 100th anniversary of Origin of Species, of course, he was called upon to pontificate on this wonderful occasion. And so this man laid it on the line and said, embryology gives the best proof for evolution. Embryology gives the best proof that a one-celled organism turned into a human body through a material process of evolution. And by that, he meant the drawings of Ernst Haeckel. Now, what did the Pope ask Catholic intellectuals to do? To meekly assent to the consensus view? No, to examine. But 11 years later, Father Karl Rahner, arguably the most influential Catholic theologian in the entire world in the 20th century, went into print saying, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. When I was in my mother's womb, I had... I went through a fish stage when I had gills. I went through an amphibian stage. I went through a reptile stage when I had a vestigial tail. And only finally did I reach the fully human stage, maybe at 12 weeks, something like that. Now, this was the very time when my dad took the helm at IPPF and they took off the mask and they pushed for abortion on demand all over the world. Now they could say, you Catholics, look at your best, your smartest people because Father Ronner was just one of a zillion of them. They're smart enough to recognize that evolution is a fact. How can you people be so stupid as to think that what's only going through the fish stage or the amphibian stage deserves all the rights and protections of a fully developed human being? And these people bear a very heavy weight of responsibility for allowing the anti-culture of death to take over the world. And it was for no good reason. Because on the top row, next slide, are the Ernst Haeckel forgeries. On the bottom row are the actual photographs published in the journal Scientific American in 1994 showing the human embryo and the embryos of the other kinds of organisms at the same stage of development. And any child can see that the human embryo is completely distinct from all the others at the same stage of development. But any child can also see that each kind of organism is also distinct from all the others. This completely contradicts all of the predictions of the leading evolutionists from Darwin to T.H. Huxley to Ernst Haeckel to Julian Huxley to Carl Sagan to Richard Dawkins and the rest of them today. But it agrees perfectly with the sacred history of Genesis where Moses tells us 10 times that God created each kind of creature to reproduce after its kind. But my brothers and sisters, this is a 21st century biology textbook. And I am ashamed to tell you, it is co-authored, next slide, by a prominent member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. I can hardly tell any difference between these drawings and the Ernst Haeckel forgeries from the 19th century. But look at the caption. It says, all vertebrates start out with an enlarged head region, gill slits, and a tail. This is complete garbage. What are called gill slits have nothing to do with breathing. They develop into the pharyngeal arches in different parts of the facial anatomy. We never have a vestigial tail. But what happens to our children and grandchildren when they read things like this, especially in a biology class in a Catholic school or university? They think that 
Evolution is true. Look at all this evidence. Genesis is a fairy tale. And yet, just as blessed Pope Pius IX said, it's Genesis that is the history, and it is evolution that is the fable. And if you come back tomorrow, as I hope that you will, we will see that the acceptance of evolution has been the greatest disaster for scientific and medical research in the history of the world. And we must go back and we must restore the traditional doctrine of creation that was handed down from the apostles as the foundation of our faith. In the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Okay, right now is the break, half an hour. There's um, food and refreshments in the parish hall downstairs, and uh, of course the bathrooms. And so please come back in a half an hour, which is 8.15, and then I'll do the um, introduction of Father Ripperger.
together. Okay, if we could have everybody settle down a little bit so we can get started. The uh, sooner we start, the sooner you all can be on your way. So. For those of you that are going to have a question, we will be handing out uh, a Q&A card, it's a regular index card. The ushers will be coming down the aisles uh, and just raise your hand if you like one. Uh, there are pens and pencils in the, in the pews. Uh, so that will happen after our discussion. So just be aware of that for now and think of maybe the question you would wanna ask. All right, technically we have two more minutes, so I'm gonna hang tight and make sure everybody gets their, gets seated. One more minute. I know some of you already have Q&A cards, but for those of you who don't, just uh, maybe at the end when we're done, put up your hand and the ushers will come and see you and give you one. Remember, one question per speaker, okay? And then they'll come and pick up all of the Q&A cards. Um, and then we're gonna give them to the speakers and the speakers are gonna choose the order of how they want to answer 
since we have so many people here. <clears throat> About 10 seconds. <laughs> okay, it's not a real countdown, but... Okay, I'm going to start now. Um, like I said, the, the two talks that we hear today go hand in glove, and the talks tomorrow will go hand in glove. We have the same speakers, the two talking today, as talking tomorrow. So I'd like to first introduce our distinguished, our second distinguished speaker, presenter, Father Chad Ripperger, who was born and raised in Casper, Wyoming. He has a bachelor's degree in both theology and philosophy from the University of San Francisco. He then earned a master's in philosophy at the Center for Thomistic Studies at the University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas. While in seminary, he completed a master's in theology at Holy Apostles Seminary in Cromwell, Connecticut. He was sent to Rome to complete his doctorate in philosophy at the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross. Upon ordination in 1997 with the priestly fraternity of St. Peter, he spent time at a parish in Omaha, Nebraska, and then was assigned to a teaching position at St. Gregory the Great Seminary in Seward, Nebraska, where he taught for four years. He also taught for six years at Our Lady of Guadalupe Seminary in Denton, Nebraska, and subsequently he spent three years in a parish in Idaho. He is now the superior of a society that he founded called the Society of the Most Sorrowful Mother. They are also known as the Doloran Fathers. Father Ripperger is a leading expert in spiritual warfare and exorcism with many published works, including Deliverance Prayers for Use by the Laity, The Metaphysics of Evolution, The Principle of the Integral Good, and his latest book, Dominion, The Nature of Diabolical Warfare. You can find these books and many others at his website, censustraditionis.org. You will also see him frequently interviewed on many Catholic podcasts and video channels at, such as Census Fidelium. He is often quoted throughout Catholic media. He is a highly sought after speaker and lecturer with his education, while his education and years of diverse experience give his presentations a wealth of informative insight into the Catholic faith and tradition. So please, before I give the final welcome, I would like to ask you no recording. Um, this is under license, so uh, we have official recording and audio and video recordings that are going on, so I would ask you to please not record this, okay? But we are very, very grateful to have uh, Father Ripperger here this, week, uh, this weekend, and we'd like to welcome back to Wisconsin, Father Ripperger. Should we start with a prayer? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Direct, O Lord, all our actions by thy holy inspirations and carry them on by thy gracious assistance, so that every prayer and work of ours may begin from thee and by thee, be happy in through Christ our Lord, amen. Mary, seat of wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. You know, when you follow Hugh at a conference, you kind of like want to just stop and say, yeah, what he said, right? <laughs> Every time I listen to him, it's just fantastic. It reminds me on the, in the uh, scriptures where they talk about being on the road to Emmaus, and they're like, was, weren't our hearts burning, you know, from what he was saying, how he's revealing the scriptures? You know, for three to five years, maybe four, We've been hearing the phrase as a mantra, but we've heard it for a long time, but we've been hearing the phrase as a mantra of trust the science. You know, I believe the science. I believe in the science, right? This is just at a time when you have people standing up who claim to be scientists or medical uh, professionals who stand up in front of Congress and tell us that men can get pregnant. 
We were told in the 80s that we were going to go through a, 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 actually this was in the 70s, I think, that we were going to go that it was absolutely certain that unless we changed our ways, we were going to actually go through a global ice age. 20 years later, that didn't happen, of course. Then they tell us, well, now we're going through global warming. That didn't work. So now they're telling us, now we're going through global climate change. But in each instance, they were cramming this down our throat as if it was dogma. Then, of course, you had the whole COVID thing come out. Oh, it'll only take two weeks to flatten the curve. These were all being told to us by scientists, right? And the problem is, is that what's happened now is, is that their credibility has gotten to the point where people just don't believe what they say, especially when they tell you, oh, if you eat potatoes, you're going to get cancer. Really? But we have to eat bugs. We're all going to have to start eating bugs here pretty quick, right? Because we have to save the planet as if God didn't design a system to handle the use of fossil fuels. Actually, they're not even fossil fuels, some of them. So the point being is, is that science has basically entered into a crisis. And the reason I'm starting out with this is because there is a metaphysical impossibility, as we'll see as we get towards the end in relationship to evolution. All of the problems that we're actually seeing in science now is actually present in the evolutionary hypothesis if you know what you're looking at. And this is the problem that we're actually being, we're dealing with into such a degree that when you, start, when you start really analyzing evolution, you begin to realize that it's contrary to reason. Hugh talked a little bit about it already. Part of it has to do with the fact that the science is obviously in a crisis. Science today appears to be under the control of financial interests, a political agenda. In fact, one of the things that's slowly coming out is that the funding of uh, research in this country by the government is heavily dependent upon whether you accept their criteria and their understanding of certain things in the scientific community. And if you don't, there's no money. So it's no longer seen as an organized body of knowledge of things as their causes, as Hugh mentioned that there's no longer seen that a science is something which, it's an organized body, which means it deals with a particular object from a very specific point of view using a particular method. That's what a science is. And that means that a science, if you take it in its proper understanding of a knowledge of body of things through their causes, the empirical sciences are not the only sciences. Hugh mentioned that theology is a science, but here's the real kicker. So is philosophy. If philosophy is not a science, we have a fundamental problem. And this is why. The defi to define a thing is a philosophical endeavor, to define it, right? I, I, obviously, we know it's a philosophical endeavor because the scientists can't even tell us what a woman is. All right, so it's obviously a philosophical endeavor. So, if philosophy is not a science, and to define a thing is a philosophical activity because you can't take a definition and put it in a lab to test whether it's true or not. It's the, it's the philosophical presuppositions that undergird a science that determine how it proceeds. It determines how we're gonna actually look at this object. As I mentioned, a science has an object it studies, it looks at it from a particular point of view, and that point of view is very often determined by our phil philosophy. Let me give you an example. The notion of time dilation of Einstein is based upon Kant's understanding of time and matter and space. Kant. So that's where he got it. So the point being is, is that, the, and the scientists all know, it's the philosophy that undergirds this. If, but if philosophy isn't a science, and it's the one that defines things, then if it's not, if, if we have a situation where it's not a science, then we can't have a scientific definition of science. That's what that means in the end. And all of this is basically why, because what's happened is, is over the course of time, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it as we go along, but also tomorrow, is, is that the modern science began in the wrong place. 
In fact, the actual, by, by, by wrong place, I mean in the sense of the philosophical presuppositions that were adopted ended up putting us in a situation where the empirical science has become at variance even with itself. It can't even conclude anything, it seems. The problem, if you look at the problem of the collapse of science to some degree, is very unfortunate because of the fact that just at a time when our technology has reached a certain stage, which is kind of a reflection of some of the science, but once it's reached a certain stage where we could be advancing the sciences in a tremendous amount of way, they're completely hampered by political agenda and profound philosophical error. That's what we're dealing with. You know, instead of actually studying things, they're actually more worried about, you know, whether men can become um, mothers or not, right? So this collapse is ultimately in connection to a very specific principle, which I want to spend a little bit of time on, and it's the principle of evidence. Now, if you actually look at Aristotle's discussion uh, in his metaphysics, but then also St. Thomas has a wonderful um, a, uh, introduction to his commentary on Aristotle's metaphysics, in the beginning of that, St. Thomas says that if you actually look at, the, of me, at metaphysics, it's actually broken down into three parts. The first part is the study of being, what a thing is. What does it mean for a thing to exist? What is an essence? The fact that the, an essence never changes. I'm not going to get into that because it's, it's a whole thing in itself. Is itself an intrinsic denial of the uh, evolutionary hypothesis? Because once it changes, it ain't that essence anymore. The second thing, is, and that's just one reason, but so it, it de deals with the natures of being. The second one is natural theology. What we can know about God through the natural light of reason, you can actually know that God exists with certitude, and you can actually come to the knowledge of his 16 attributes purely by the natural light of reason without revelation. The last one is what we call first philosophy, and this is the philosophy that studies first principles. What's a first principle? It's one in which once it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a proposition that once you hear it, as long as you have use of reason, you immediately understand that it's true. Okay, I'll give you a couple of examples. The first, one of the first principles is called the principle of identity. A thing is what it is. Okay, when you hear that, that makes sense. Or another one is, a thing cannot not be and be in the same time in the same respect. That's called the principle of non-contradiction, but you could boil it down to things can't contradict themselves and both be true, right? And we know that to be the case. Once you hear that principle and understand the term St. Thomas says, the intellect immediately gives assent to the truth of it. Well, one of the principles that, there's a whole series of principles. When I wrote the book, Metaphysics of Evolution, it was actually to start applying these principles. And then I also did it, um, which we're going to talk a little bit about, on the principle of the integral good, which has been systematically denied by the, quote, greatest generation, unquote. This is one of the things that we're going to talk about. But these principles are being systematically denied in the sciences itself, and it's rendering them irrational. And this is why when we see these things being said, anybody with just a modicum amount of common sense knows this is just not true. The thing is, is that once you understand the principles and start looking at evolution in light of that, you begin to realize even evolution is analogous to saying that a man can have a kid, right? This is one of the reasons I'm very sensitive to this whole thing. You get some guy standing there and his wife's pregnant and he says, we're pregnant. No, we are not. <laughs> she is pregnant, you're expecting. Two entirely different things. But it's an indicator that our language has gotten so sloppy and lack of precision that it's creating a, a significant problem so this principle of evidence, we're going to go into it in depth, but I want to talk first of all about how it collapsed and how it ended up affecting evolution. The problem began with Descartes, René Descartes. Now, Hugh mentioned him, and René, De, René Descartes caused a lot of damage in philosophy, but one of the principal things he did is he started his entire philosophical endeavor on skepticism. 
And it was based in this. He said, if I take a stick and I stick it in the water, the, the stick looks like it's bent, but I know intellectually that it doesn't bend. Right? And so I can't trust my senses to tell me the truth. Now look at what he just did. He separated the criteria from truth from reality and knowledge through your senses to purely what's in your own mind. That was the very beginning of that. I always tell people we put people in rubber rooms for what this guy became famous for. Okay. That skepticism then gets passed on. So then you have, there's a guy by the name of Hume, we're not going to go into it. He had this critique of causality. And so between him, between Descartes' cogito, that is, I think, therefore, I am, because he wanted certitude. He wanted to found science in something that was absolutely certain, and so he started basically with mathematics, etc. but he basically started with, you know, I think, therefore I am, which is actually not true. It's you, you are, therefore you're capable of thought. It's not that your thought means it proves anything, okay? We'll see that in a minute. But this cogito, and, uh, or this idea of Descartes and his skepticism, then led, and uh, coupled with Hume's critique of causation, resulted in Immanuel Kant saying that there's no way we can ultimately know reality. And because we can't know reality because ultimately all I can know is my experience of reality. That became the cornerstone to modernism, the heresy of modernism. It's called the principle of eminence. We'll talk about that more tomorrow. But this problem of separating, the, so the, the evidence is what? It's facts. It's what we actually know to be the case. You know, I can look at this floor and see that it's brown, right? And it's through my senses that I actually know that's true. The problem with Descartes was he didn't realize that his senses were telling him exactly the reality of what was going on. The reality that was going on is that the light was refracting. And so that refraction, it's telling you the light is refracting, refracting not that the stick is bent. And that's actually, it's still reality that has to be the basis of truth. In fact, the definition of truth for the entire tradition of the church, or the tradition, philosophical tradition, it took a little while to get it fully formulated, but it was, when my intellect conforms to reality. It's when I know in my mind what is actually in reality. And what happens is, is when people use lucid reason, when people become insane, our culture is becoming insane, right? When it becomes insane, what a person believes is true is no longer what reality states it is, it's what they think is in their own mind. This is why Kant, in the end, said that what constitutes truth is when my thoughts just don't contradict each other. It's called the principle of coherence, which actually can be true to some degree, but in point and fact, we only know it's true when it's connected to reality. It's reality that you have to look at. And this is where the principle of evidence becomes so key. Because the principle of evidence is going to put, a, it makes reality the foundation for what I assert as true or not, or whether my science is true or not. So this collapse, this separation, this led to the idea that philosophy could not provide any clear answers according to Descartes, and so we must turn to the empirical only. It gave excessive certitude to the empirical sciences, well, that's breaking down. There are philosophical propositions that are actually more certain than two plus two equals four, the principle of identity. If two ain't two, then two plus two don't equal four. That's why that principle of identity that two is two is more foundational than even mathematics. In fact, mathematics is founded on it. And yet this was what was denied. So this disconnect from reality, which we now see in the empirical sciences, resulted in a specific kind of approach today, where they deny the principle of evidence. We're going to get to it. We see this in science, ignoring facts and evidence. They just ignore it, acting like it doesn't exist. Where did this come from? It came from statistics. See, in statistics, what you do is, is that you, you poll, say, 1,000 people, or you, or you just look at, say, 1,000 different kind of cases. And then from that, what you do is you 
uh, create a bell curve. I'm sure you've all seen them you, or from it. And then what you do is, is there's certain statistics, there's certain parts of the data that just don't line into the bell curve, and so you simply drop them as anomalies, right? That can work in statistics if your idea is like, I just want to get a general idea of how many, what's the general percentage of people who actually think that, um, you know, that, that Biden was true when he said, you might have the facts, but we have the truth. All right. <laughs> so I just want to, sorry, I can't. It's just one of those things that every time I just, I, I was howling for an hour after that, laughing so hard. <laughs> But you see that that is the issue, right? What he said, actually, modern philosophy would actually agree with him. But in statistics, when it comes to the extremes, you simply drop that data and you focus only on the data that fits the bell curve. And so what happens is there could be error in the data. There could be a variety of different reasons why you would drop some of the, those information. Could be that just it wasn't the, the polling wasn't done properly or what have you. So there can be a variety of different ways why you drop the data that doesn't fit the bell curve. The collection of data, however, though, can also be selective. I don't know if you're aware of this, but in the United States, they have the demographics mapped so accurately they can tell block by block in every street in this country, the political tenor of that block. So much so that what they can do is, well, we want this politician, to, you know, we, we don't want to make him look too good because then we know that's all ridiculous. So what we're going to do is we know that over in this part of the country, there's this percentage of people, so we're going to pull this, and then we're going to pull those areas to get the statistic we want. That's what we're seeing. That's why statistics in the, you know, the, in the uh, 2016 election just floundered because it was all being done selectively. So even statistics can be manipulated by agenda. What I'm basically saying is in statistics, this can have a legitimate place, but obviously it can also be manipulated. So what's happened is, is in modern science is they, they come up with a theory now and instead of testing it, which they might do to some degree, they'll only, but if they do to test it, they'll make sure that the test is a control group that is specifically designed to get a specific outcome rather than just testing the thing and seeing how it actually works. Which, by the way, that, I, that idea of testing a thing to prove your hypothesis actually came from St. Uh, Albert the Great, most people are unaware of. So what happens though is, is that they, so what's happening in the modern science is when the, when, the, when the evidence contradicts the theory, they just drop it as an anomaly and then just move on and keep pushing their theory. Evolution, you know, Freud didn't get everything wrong. I mean, got most things wrong, but he didn't get everything wrong. His theory of projection is, is that I get something in my mind and then I project it onto reality and that's not what the reality actually is. But evolution is a case of projection. Because we can imagine things, but we are adding formality and finality into the causation of our own minds thinking about it into the existing reality. Let me give you an example. Every one of you have seen, I think Hugh just in fact showed it, where you have the, you start out with the little animals and it goes up and then you finally get to apes and then humans and so you see this progression, right? It's called the fallacy of overgeneralization. That's what that actually is. We think of how things would evolve and then we look at the da data set, we look at the different creatures that are alive and then we arrange them in our own minds in a series and then say, well, this is how this happened. That, may, that has nothing to do with the reality of the situation. It has to do with us imposing form onto this thing that doesn't necessarily exist. It was the same problem with St. Anselm's ontological argument for God's existence. Just because I think of a God that could not possibly not exist doesn't mean that your proof works that he exists. You have to base it on other things. It's, an illo it's a logical, illicit move to go from what my mind thinks to reality. It has to be the other way around. Reality has to impose on my mind what the conformity has to be. 
So when you see this chart of the various stages of life, that in point, and that this, and the implication is that man will evolve. Well, man will evolve. You talked a little bit about that. That's why we have, you know, this idea that even in theology, that everything's evolving. It's the fallacy of overgeneralization. Once the moorings of scientific reasoning is severed from reality, from the principle of evidence, then fraud is shortly on its heels. There was a guy by the name of Teilhard de Chardin. He was involved in what's called the Piltdown Man. Now, Piltdown was basically a series or a collection of bones they put together and said, this fits into these particular aspects of evolution in order to buttress and give stronger uh, support to the evolution. The problem is, those bones weren't from the same animals. And Chardin knew it. This guy was one of the most influential theologians at the Second Vatican Council, and he still is even at the top of the church today. He was an absolute fraud. And this is what ends up happening. And so this is one of the reasons why once you reject the first principles, once you reject reality as the basis of your science, you're, what's going to happen is you're going to end up with fraud. And if you look at evolution, if you actually listen, there was a conference which I gave, actually, it was in this area. When I said, if you actually listen to the Freemasons when they were first listening to this, they knew, said, no, no, this is true. This is all ridiculous. But we're going to use it anyway to our ends. This is why at the very root of evolution is fundamentally a rejection of first principles. And Aristotle said that if someone... Stop, if someone stops accepting the truth of a first principle, then they've lost use of reason. This is why we're seeing our country just out of its mind. And so as a result of that, he says, stop talking to them. Right? Now, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't actually engage in legitimate debate in relationship to evolution and things of this sort. But my basic point is, is that if... If in a, in a discussion that someone is unwilling to accept first principles as being legitimately applied to the uh, uh, evolutionary hypothesis, you have to stop listening to him. Don't even argue with him because you're not going to get anywhere. It's literally like trying to argue with a madman. So what is the principle of evidence? It has different forms. The first formulation is the objective evidence of being is the criterion of the truth of ascent. Okay, so it's objective reality. The evidence as you see in reality is the criterion of truth of ascent. It determines whether I should think the thing is true or not. This is why when they're sitting there telling us that men, women, men can have children, right, carry children to term, you're just like, yeah, sorry, reality doesn't bear that out. And it is also, the, so it's reality, is also the motive for the certitude of the ascent. So there's two things in this. The first is the degree of certitude. We see this in relationship to the following. Evolution and many scientific theories have gotten to the point where when you start looking at the actual hypothesis behind them, if you start looking at it, you actually have to assume a series of presuppositions. For example, you have to presume that stratification happened in the manner that it did, that they suppose it did. You have to presume, right, that, uh, as we'll see this a little bit later, that the principle of sufficient reason doesn't apply, that something lesser can give greater to something bigger. You have to make a, a number of different assumptions, even about the data. So when they present the data, like these were the small, these were the, it was at this level that you see the, the ocean, oceanic and then the small birds and then the animals, da 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 da, da you know, and this is, rather than the actual fact that the flood could have just wiped it out in a series of sta four stages which puts them in that stratification, All right? But the certitude, and this is the thing that bothers me the most about when you hear these scientists talk, is the fact that they, act like it's dogma. No, this is a hypothesis. This is not 
an absolute truth. The fact that they've been pushing it for so long just proves that Goebbels was right. You lie low enough and people start to believe it. That's going to become a problem tomorrow when I'm going to start talking about why the clergy don't sign off on it. And the reason the clergy don't sign off it is because of it's on a habituation. They've been just been lied to for so long. So if you actually look at evolution, it doesn't have the certitude proportionate to the way that they're saying that it does. But there's other scientific theories too. Once you start accepting evolution, then you backtrack, and then you got to go to the Big Bang. Well, the problem with the Big Bang is especially in light of the James Webb Space Telescope, which is starting to find um, uh, fully blown, full blown formed galaxies at 400 million years, according to their timetable, 400 million years old, which actually predates when they should have been formed that much. And also now they found other items that predate the actual Big Bang. And you're just like, well, there you go. Right. The evidence is throwing them all into a tizzy, and they're spending enormous amounts of energy trying to salvage the hypothesis. Right? Okay. Now, or, and then, or you work up these mathematical models, and so then in the end, what you have to do is you have to start introducing all sorts of things that are just absurd. It's literally fairy tales, like string theory. You know, the next thing you find out, there's string theory. And then there's dark matter, right? So, because why? You've backed yourself into a corner based on your hypothesis and your mathematics was based on your hypothesis, so then you get to, you back yourself into a corner because it doesn't work. And so then you have to do the deus ex machina. That deus ex machina basically means you have to throw in something in order to solve the problem, so they throw in dark matter or time or, you know, what have you in order to solve the problem. Okay. So evolution and string theory, dark matter, they don't have sufficient evidence to conclude with any degree of certitude with this. This becomes a big of a problem. I mean, we even saw this in the vaccine things. I was just kind of watching the whole COVID thing with a bit of morbid fascination. And as I'm watching this, of course, within a week, I'm like, this whole thing's bogus. So, but, but I mean, I'm not saying that COVID doesn't exist. I'm not saying that. But, but I, I was just kind of watching. First of all, anytime the government and the news media constantly tells us something over and over and over and over and over again, I'm like, okay, that's a red flag right there. <laughs> all right. So... But if you actually, what, what, but you see this, that the principle of evidence, they try to certain degrees of certitude about stuff that we just didn't have. Two weeks to flatten the curve, as I mentioned before. But the real butte was when they say those who get the vaccine, it actually ameliorates their symptomology in the hospitals. They said that before they had any statistical data whatsoever for it. And yet they were pushing it as more certain than it was. This is a problem. But the problem is it's the same thing. You see this very same thing with evolution, where it's being pushed, and it's, it's, it's this mantra that has occurred for so long, and yet the evidence doesn't line out. So a corollary, so we get to the second thing. The corollary is, and this is the formulation that I use very often about, this is one of the formulations of the principle of evidence. A single piece of evidence contrary to a theory, renders the theory in part or in whole false. Let me restate that again. A single piece of evidence contrary to a theory renders the theory in part or in whole false. This is based on the metaphysical fact that truth and being are one and the principle of non-contradiction. So you can't have contradictory pieces of evidence and your theory be true. It's contrary to the principle of non-contradiction and it's based upon the very nature of being. This means that when we consider astrophysics or evolution, both evolution in the micro sense, that is minor changes among animals, and the macro sense, and the life sciences in general, the statistical model simply does not apply. You can't drop evidence your theory or your uh, hypothesis can only be true when it takes into consideration all of the evidence, all of it. For example, some of you have probably seen this. You can actually see the pictures online. In the Paluxy River, which I think is in Texas, I think, 
But anyway, there are tracks that were discovered in 1908 where there are human tracks inside of dinosaur tracks. And from the evidence, if you look at it, it looks like it suggests that the humans were tracking the dinosaur. If they were separated by hundreds of millions of years, that, that one piece of evidence simply should not exist, but it does. This discovery alone, based upon the principle of evidence, renders the stratification theories, the time theories that they say are all this, false either in part or in whole, period. Second, they actually find these still, to this day I've been told, in Pennsylvania in some of the coal mines, but the polystrate trees, these are uh, upright fossilized trunks which push through many layers of rock, right? So if stratification happened over hundreds of millions of years, how do you get a tree that basically exists through literally hundreds of million, two to three hundred million years of rock intact in that manner. It's, it is impossible scientifically if it lasts that long. It's more reasonable to presume that it actually occurred together all at once. Stratification does, does not mean the time that they came from. In other words, what does this actually mean? The problem is, is that there are a variety of different explanations for stratification which would determine the times in which these things would actually occur. The days, and actually if you look at the flood, there is a great Protestant, the Protestants very often are doing more work in this than we are, but there is a great Protestant, uh, or, um, it's a video in which they talk about, if you look very, close, very closely, close attention to Genesis, the flood happened in four stages. And those four stages actually would correspond to why the stratification occurred and why you see uh, different animals in their thing. In fact, one of the things they point out is if you look in Texas, what they found out is that the large dinosaur tracks were heading north. And they were heading out of north because the water table was rising. And they could tell they were walking in water. But they were heading north, and that's why they all ended, because as they headed north, they were going up in altitude, and that's actually why you see this conglomeration in Wyoming and in Montana and South, uh, um, South Dakota of massive death fields for dinosaurs. They're just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dinosaurs in, the, in single fields. It's because it re reached the level, but they had all moved in that direction. The point being is, is that their theory of stratification does not provide the, the evidence, doesn't supp supply the certitude that they're trying to assert in relationship to this. Time, again, is one of those deus ex machina. You know, well, you know, we, we're not seeing anything really change right now. In fact, I have a theory. I could be proven wrong, but I have a theory. My theory is, is that one of the reasons that God is letting us see so much of the universe and see all these nooks and crannies and sending all these probes into various um, uh, moons of various planets and going by all the planets is because he wants to show us that the entire universe is sterile except here. And the reason it's sterile is precisely because of the fact that contained in matter itself is not a sufficient cause to create life in itself. It's a form that has to be imposed by God, and that's why we're only seeing it here. Another variant of the principle of evidence is whatever is objectively evident is true. Scientific studies and research being done with predetermined outcomes rather than the evidence is the death of science. It's going to kill it. And you see it, it's killing it. Every judgment must be based in evidence is another formulation of the principle of evidence. And that basically means, therefore, that in relationship to uh, evolution, the judgment about the certitude and the truth of that hypothesis can only be done when you look at all of the evidence. All scientific conclusions must be based on all of the evidence. 
Any exclusion of evidence that does not fit one's theory nullifies the validity of the theory and calls into question the scientific basis of that theory. So if you actually look at the fact that there, we now have genetic entropy, that's one of the things they discovered, that mutations don't beget better things, they actually beget a bigger problem, and that we're actually declining. This is one of the things, reasons I tell people that, you know, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but we are actually dumber, because they found out it's actually affecting our brains. We're dumber than our ancestors. And all you gotta do is turn on the TV and watch for five minutes, and you know that's true. <laughs> all right. So that's the principle of evidence. The principle of evidence itself, just if you look at it, gives you sufficient reason to recognize, okay, look it, evolution has some serious issues. But then there's also the principle of sufficient reason. The principle of sufficient reason says that the existence of a thing is accountable either in itself or in another. What does that mean? Well, colloquially, you would say that uh, you can't give what you don't have. When I, the first time, I can't remember if it was Dawkins or Hawkins, I can't remember, I can't keep the, I, 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 their image of them are obviously very distinct, but their names. But one of them said, you know, that the gap between something and nothing in the beginning was so intensely small that it just jumped out into a being. So first of all, the gap between nothing and something is not small, it's infinite. That's why it takes an infinite power. It takes God to bring something into existence. Second, what's this it you're talking about? It doesn't exist. You just said there's nothing, so it doesn't exist so that it can't pop out. So quit talking that way. <laughs> I mean, even just the sentence, you know, nothing, it, popped into something, is irrational on the face of it. And yet they expect us to believe this. Without a doubt, this principle of sufficient reason is the most violated among the evolutionary theorists. Since one species does not have the existence or of the essence in itself to be able to confer it to another species, it cannot be the cause of another species or essence. Let me put it to you this way. If you don't have eyeballs, you can't give something eyeballs. It's that simple. People will say, well, there was a variety of different causes and they all came together. Yeah, here's the problem. The con if you look at all of those causes and put them together, they still don't have sufficient act, that's a technical metaphysical phrase, for saying they don't have enough to produce this thing that's higher than them. Because that thing that they're producing requires a level of organization that these things are not capable of producing on their own. You can throw in as many causes as you want. You can put all the chemicals you want in that primordial soup. You ain't gonna come out with a bacteria because it can't produce it on its own. Well, that's why we have lightning. The lightning can't produce life. In fact, if you ever notice, lightning kills everything. <laughs> all right. Aside from problems with the Big Bang, evolution does not provide a sufficient reason for the existence of the species because it's saying that these lower things gave, gave rise to something hot, something greater than their, them, even collectively. The greater the, so this means that there has to be, it's called the principal proportion causality. There has to be a proportionate cause. If you're going to get A, well, you have to have something that has the same amount of existence, the same amount of perfection, the same kind of perfection as A. At least, analogically, because God has all perfections contained in him, but it's done in an analogical fashion. And basically, the principle of proportion causation says the effect cannot be greater than the cause. But that's exactly what evolution purports. It purports this primordial soup, which is just soup. It's just a conglomeration that gave rise to life. I'm using that by way of example. I'm sure they'd have more sophisticated ways of putting it now. But it's the same thing. Even in every single step of going from one species to another, we're not talking about changes within a species, right? Well, I mean, we can breed dogs and we get all sorts of different stuff out of them, so we do know that those things can change. But here we're talking about within a species. The cause, another variant of the principle of, of proportional cause is the cause must possess at least virtually whatever perfection it gives to the effect. 
You have to have it before you can give it. These people that deny that principle, I want to just walk up and say, hey, give me a million dollars. I don't have a million dollars. Huh? So what? What does that mean? That doesn't mean anything. You should be able to just pull that rabbit out of your hat because that's what you're telling me evolution does. By the way, if you've got a million dollars in your pocket, I have a chapel I need to build. Anyway. <laughs> variants. Another variant. Activities cannot surpass the perfection of the natures, forms, or powers which perform them. Very important. Let me go over that one again. Activities cannot surpass the perfection of the natures, forms, and powers which perform them. This is why an ape can't give rise to a human being. Right? Because in itself, the perfections, natures, forms, and powers that the ape has are not proportionate to produce a human being, which is a higher thing. In the context of evolution, this is connected to the principle of sufficient reason, but it is formally different. In the case of the principle of sufficient reason, there has to be accountability relative to the existence of the thing, either in itself or in another. But this principle indicates that in effect cannot be greater than the cause. In the case of macroevolution, the higher being, the effect, is greater than the cause. So this is something that's very key for us to keep and understand. Two or more causes do not con that do not contain the perfection of the effect are not capable of producing the effect. This is, we just know this. Then there's the principle of the integral good. So I'm going to give you the Latin. I'm going to break it down a bit uh, of what it means. So the Latin is bonum ex intrica causa, malum ex quad cumque defecto. And basically, good is from an integral cause. Evil from any defect whatsoever. And we know this, right? You can have somebody whose face is absolutely perfect, but if their nose is off to the side, you realize, okay, they're not beautiful, right? There's something off there. That's not good. We also know this. Right? And this is something that's breaking down in our culture in general. The principle of the integral good is, is really breaking down because of the fact that people are psychologically isolating, they're ignoring the evidence, they're psychologically isolating things, you know, and only focusing on the good little thing that they're getting out of it and ignoring what's actually, actually really occurring. So let me give you an exa example. Now, I use this example not because I have anything against these particular class of people. I kind of like them. But I always tell people, well, look it. Let's just say for the sake of argument that I really like to see when people enjoy flying through the air. Right? And that's what my intention is, is to help this guy enjoy life. So I take a midget and I throw him off the top of a building. Right? My intention doesn't change the reality that I just murdered him, right? And this is something that's very important. So in a moral act, the intention, what you're doing, that's called the object of the moral act, and the circumstances, all of them have to be good or your act is morally bad, right? And so this is something that's really important for us to see that this principle of the integral good means that Something is good precisely because its cause is integral. On the side of the cause, there is a complete, there's completeness to be able to bring about the effect. Scripture recounts, and God saw all the things that he made, and they were good. Good. Death is not a good. The fact that, uh, you mentioned this, the fact that people say, you know, that the evolutionists say, well, God used all this death and mayhem in order to bring this up to, uh, I mean, there's so many different problems with evolution, but this is just one of them, that God uses is contrary to what we know in Scripture. In Scripture, the fact that what God made was good means that the principle of good also applies to creation. We read in St. Thomas that since the completion, which is according to the integrity of the parts of the universe, integrity, which means in its wholeness, the completion, which is according to the wholeness of the parts of the universe, suits the sixth day. <clears throat> the consummation, which is according to operation of the parts, suits the seventh. Okay. Or is able to be said that in a continuous motion, sometimes something is able to be moved further. It is not called perfect motion before the quiet, for the quiet demonstrates the completion of motion. 
God was able to make more creatures other than those which he made in the sixth day. Hence it is said that his work was completed when he ceased to create new creatures on the seventh day, unquote. What St. Thomas is saying is that the work of creation ceased at the end of the sixth day. Scripture essentially reveals that creation ended, creation, bringing new beings into existence on the sixth day, and that on the seventh day God rested, and it is a time that providence and conservation of being begin. So he creates, and then he preserves them in being and provides for them. This means that the diversity of creatures which we find in the created order is due to God's creative activity, which ceased on the sixth day, which does not envision an evolutionary process, nor just because, as we saw above, that there are no secondary causes in the act of creation. In other words, you can't, they, you, a secondary cause, a created cause. I mentioned that to bring something from nothing to existence is an infinite gap and requires an infinite power, and only God can do that. So no secondary cause, no human being, nothing is capable of, of, as a secondary cause, being able to bring something into existence that didn't exist before. <clears throat> Given what is revealed, theistic evolution cannot be tenable insofar as creation is an act of God and terminates at a certain point. And thus, the theistic evolution is subject to the criticism of violation of the first metaphysical principles. We're going to see this as we go on. Also, given what is revealed, the theistic evolution is untenable insofar as there has to be constant miracles. That's what I'm going to deal with later. St. Thomas observes that the first perfection, which is the integrity, so it's good, in its wholeness, was in the first institution of things. It's in the very beginning. For St. Thomas, the cessation of creative activity on the side of God and the fact that creation was good means that creation of God was intricately good. So that basically means that when God created, he doesn't mess up and he doesn't do it half-baked and he doesn't do it in a manner that requires natural and physical evils. When considering the perfection or good of God's creation, one was, is left with a twofold distinction. The first has to do with the perfection of the individual parts of creation in which in themselves they are all perfect in their institution, that is, when they're created. <coughs> so in the very beginning, they're brought into, into, uh, into perfection. The second is how all the individual parts come together to constitute a perfect creation. The principle of the integral good indicates that all the parts must be good in order for the thing to be considered good in its totality. Therefore, the evolutionary hypothesis is untenable for the following two reasons. One, according to the evolutionary hypothesis, the initial creation of God was not integrally good as to the totality of creation because it was incomplete. In effect, the gradation of being there's also called the principle of gradation of being, had gaps which indicated the totality of creation was not intricately good. God did not create a good creation. That's what they're telling us. The parts were also not intricately good insofar as they were evolving and we must say mutating in various degrees and steps without complete, being complete in themselves. So putting aside the fact that the mutation is generally bad for something, the fact is, is that God would have created something that is constantly striving for completion, not in him, but in the completion of themselves. This means that creation did not possess the good integrally. So what does this basically mean? It means that God, if you look at how we, it's revealed in Scripture, and if you actually look at every single thing that he gets involved in, Whenever he is the sole cause or whenever the secondary cause does not block him from perfectly acting through him, he acts as an integral cause. Everything, so when he acts, God is pure goodness. He's infinite goodness. He is infinite perfection. That means when he causes something, there is never a lack of perfection or good in the nature of that thing. He is an integral cause. And so to assert that he is not an integral cause, and by basically saying that there were defects in the beginning that had to be worked out, is quite frankly against the very nature of God. It's against the very nature of metaphysical reasoning. 
Death, as Hugh said, only enters after the sin of Adam. To use death indicates that God would not be an integral cause in bringing things into existence, since things would be imperfect. So God always acts as an integral cause. By the way, this is how we know that the Catholic Church is the only divinely established means of salvation. How? It has all four of the causes. One, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. No other religion, none, has any of those four causes independently of each other integrally. None of them. None. And this is how we know that the Catholic Church is from God. This, the point being is, is that this problem of t- teaching God, saying that God uses evil in order to bring good out of it, that's post-fall because of us. But to say that he introduced things and he created things in a non-integral cause, A, it doesn't hold up metaphysically, and B, it, quite frankly, it's the height of impiety. It's basically ascribing to God imperfection in his activity. Then there is the principle of economy. Now, the principle of economy basically states that an explanation that accounts for all the facts in terms of a single or few principles is preferable to a more complex theory. You could boil it down to this. The simplest explanation is usually the best. Okay. One of the problems with evolution is that it ends up multiplying causes. You have to have all sorts of causes in order to bring this thing to the perfection that it actually is. Putting aside the fact that the evidence doesn't stack up, as I mentioned Um, Genetic entropy of itself negates the totality of the uh, evolutionary hypothesis, quite frankly, in my estimation. Could be wrong, but the fact is, is that you have to have all these causes over and over and over and over again, rather than just God bringing the thing into existence at once. In other words, evolution ends up having to assert that a number of different mutations must occur Uh, in order for something to reach a stage where it is actually useful to a particular creature that displays change from which the mutations are ordered. Each mutation must come generally from a different cause or from the same cause on a number of different occasions. And this itself multiplies the number of principles or causes and makes this theory more complex. Therefore, it violates the principle of economy. This is also true even in relationship to Theistic evolution. The variant of this principle of economy, which states that an explanation of a phenomenon is to be regarded as better or truer in which the minimum number of factors, the fewer steps in the process, and the more immediate causes are included. That's how it's formulated. The simpler, the better, and more likely to the case. This variant of the principle of economy connects with what we stated immediately above in a more explicit way. Since in some theories of evolution, there are millions of years required to gradually produce a set of characteristics in a living thing, which by the way, the more time you introduce into it, the worse it gets, is if you actually are taking a look at at it seriously. Steps are added in a process which are not necessary to postulate in order to give an adequate explanation. This is because God suffices. It doesn't mean that God doesn't use secondary causes, but this is after the initial creation. That's part of the the conservation of the being or the preservation, the providential side of things. Nor is it necessary to appeal to any kind of revelation in order to actually come to this conclusion. St. Thomas, being preeminent among the scholastics, said that every essence is immediately created by God and cannot be caused by any created substance. He shows that. He does a pretty good job in demonstrating that, which I mentioned. It is also here that we begin to realize that the theistic evolution has difficulties. In this case, we run up against a bit of a problem in the literature. Some theistic evolutionists hold that evolution is just a natural process used by God to bring about the various forms of life, which then becomes just subject to the criticisms that I've already given and others. Other theistic evolutionists hold that evolution is a case of constant miracles because they, they, they recognize the principle of sufficient reason. All these natural causes can't produce higher effects, and so God has to step in and add it. But what the problem is is that they introduce God into the issue to provide what might be lacking in the order of nature. It's a deus ex machina solution again, such as the order that one finds in the universe, which may not be accounted for by purely natural causes. 
And this introduces above the philosophical difficulty where only God can create a substance. Some theistic evolutionists may even be motivated by religious reasons in order to give credibility to the scriptures. In other words, they say, well, the, we can't believe the scriptures, and so as a result, which I'm going to talk about that tomorrow, we can't believe in the scriptures, so we have to, you know, we have to at least give some explanation that would make, to make sure that they're compatible. Or they do it in order to make God is not completely excluded, as we see in the case of some theistic evolutionary theory. They just want God to be part of it. Theistic evolution, in this sense, succumbs to different difficulties. It is a natural process used by God. Then all of the above violations of principles would likewise be applied in this case, as I just mentioned. If God is used to supply on the side of the principle of sufficient reason, it ends up violating the principle of economy because God must intervene to supply the sufficient reason at each step. This indicates that it is not strictly a natural process, but requires the introduction of God into each step to be able to achieve the next higher species in the evolutionary process. This violates the principle of economy because what is ultimately being stated is that nature does not suffice in order to produce each individual species on its own. This is true enough, principle, but theistic evolution requires God to be involved at each individual step since the laws of nature do not suffice. At each step, therefore, God must suspend the laws of nature. That is the definition of a miracle. God must suspend the laws of nature and add what is lacking in the order of nature. The definition of a miracle is something occurring aside from the whole created nature. It's something that is above and beyond the created order. If you look at these natural causes, they don't have the ability to be able to beget this thing. Theistic evolution, whether it states that in its natural process is really just a covert way of introducing constant miracles, or asserts outright that miracles are constantly necessary for the process, violate the principle of economy. It violates the principle of economy because it posits a number of causes, in this case, God intervening constantly in order to bring this thing up. Quite frankly, I would think God would say, well, that just sounds pretty tedious. All right. I shouldn't be so flippant. God creates directly all of the individual species in a short period of time without a large number of secondary causes more perfectly fulfills the principle of economy than any theory of evolution, theistic evolution included. We already know that God must be part of this on a purely metaphysical level since to go from nothing to something requires an infinite power. Regardless of whether one holds to the Aristotelian theory that the world has always existed or whether one holds to what one we know by revelation that God created these things out of nothing from the beginning does not matter. While we know from revelation that God did create everything ex nihilo, and it's a formally defined doctrine of the church, St. Thomas points out that even if one holds that the world always existed, God had to be the cause in relationship to the essences. Modern science has lost its moorings. If you are going to proceed in a science violating the first principles, you're disconnecting yourself from the reality because reality functions according to first principles. It, the reality is things don't contradict themselves. Reality is that evidence determines what we should ultimately think and whether our thought is true or not. Not all scientists, in fact, one of the things that's frustrating a lot of the scientists is that that's serious guys that are trying to do serious science and are trying to follow the proper methodology, following these first principles, etc., are getting more and more frustrated because of the fact that everybody that's, propo uh, that's proposing all the different ways to gain funding and things of that sort are all the people that are signed off on the agenda and all the things that they know need to be investigated aren't being investigated but it's lost its reasoning by rejecting the first principles. We've entered into a new dark age, so to speak. And by that I mean that modern science, by deviating from the first principles, by deviating from sound philosophy, has reached a point where the stuff that's coming out is not advancing the science. It, our technology might be advancing to some degree, but our, un, our scientific understanding of the causes of these things is not advancing. It's degrading. It's getting worse. And this is something in which until the evolutionary hypothesis is abandoned as one of those things in the modern scientists' ideas, 
that does not fulfill first principles and does not have sufficient evidence and does not have certitude until they abandon that, we're not going to see the sciences get off the ground. The same thing, that's why I said in the beginning, the same set of principles, <clears throat> the principle of evidence, that same principle behind why we know a man cannot have children is the same principle that nullifies evolution hypothesis. It's the same thing. This is why we're seeing it. But what it tells us is, is that evolution began the process of de detaching people's moorings in scientific moorings, their connection to reality. This is why it's taught so heavily in colleges, in universities, etc. Because if you can get people disconnected from the evidence regarding the truth of a scientific hypothesis, you can feed them anything you want them to believe. And that's it. Okay, there's two things left, very, very important. Um, well, three things. First of all, for the Q&A, please um, get the, the Q&A cards, which are the note cards that should be at the end of your pew. Some of you already have them. Okay, if you don't have one and you don't have any left at the end of your pew, the ushers have some and they're coming up and down with them. Just put your hand up and they'll give you one. Please write down your question. One question, please, per person, per speaker. So we have two speakers, so each of you could have two questions, one for each speaker, okay? Then the ushers will come by and pick them up and we'll give them to the speakers. And then the speakers are going to answer them. They're going to choose. And then uh, Mr. Owen will go first and answer three. Father Ripperger will answer three till we run out of time. So I don't know how many that will be. Um, but also at this time... Please consider a generous donation for these speakers and for the parish. Anything you give, 100% of it goes to the speakers and to the parish. And so um, after the Q&A cards are picked up, then um, the ushers will come back and they will be gathering donations from you. Um, so please show everyone how generous Wisconsinites are or I should say Midwestern region, because we have other states represented here. Um. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, yes, you, obviously you can give cash. Um, I mentioned the checks could go to the Colbe Center, or it's, is it SMD? SMD, Sam Mary Delta, that works. SMD is Father's... Um, Society. You could write a check out to that. You can write a check out to St. John the Evangelist or just give cash, okay? Um, oh, and one last thing too, I'm sorry, is that uh, we talked a little bit, Hugh talked a little bit about brain death, right? So we have doctors here in the audience today and tomorrow. They are um, helping us to find out about what's going on in the legislation. And I forgot to bring, they gave me a statement here to read to you, it's just one quick sentence. So you know there's something to sign at the back. If you would be interested in signing it, they will mail it for you. And here's a statement directly from the doctors, not from me, so I'm going to read it. Medical and legal elites want the Uniform Law Commission to make so-called brain death easier to declare explicitly without consent. Please sign action alert letter in opposition and leave for us to mail. Please take the information. They are, you know what, I said at the back, I believe they are actually at the, um, the merchandise sales tables downstairs. So I'm sorry to confuse you, but they're downstairs. So please get those and sign them. They'll be here tomorrow too, so we hope to see every one of you back here tomorrow. Thank you.
Okay, so please take some time now um, they're, they're, while they're gathering the donations. We really appreciate your generosity, but also um, I'd like to mention the surveys. If you would please fill out the surveys at the end of the pew um, and put them in either the survey boxes or give them to anybody who's holding a survey box. These surveys help us to know how to do these seminars in the future. So we hope to be able to invite these speakers back. Okay, just a reminder, please fill out the surveys. If you don't have one um, and you want one, we'll figure out a way to get it to you. Everyone have them?
Okay, as long as I've got a, one more, two more seconds here. Everyone remember tomorrow's start time is moved up. Registration starts at 10, and the talks begin at 11 a.m., okay? So everybody come. And walk-ins are welcome. Walk-ins are welcome. So whatever seating availability we have, uh, please bring walk-ins if we can fit them um, to the, to the uh, extent that we can. Yes, and we do have to be out of the church at 3.15 tomorrow. So that's our, uh, it's a hard deadline. We can't go past it. Please keep in mind, too, that any questions that are not answered tonight, the speakers will look them over and may be answering them tomorrow as well, in addition to some of the other ones. Okay. Now Mr. Owen will start. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to Thee. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So very quickly, a number of people asked why I sometimes refer to Saint Adam and Saint Eve. Yes, they're saints. If you look at the traditional iconography of the Holy Resurrection, or if you read the reading in the Office of Readings on Holy Saturday, the first holy people that our Lord brought out of the limbo of the fathers were St. Adam and St. Eve. And I believe their uh, liturgical feast is uh, December 24th on the traditional calendar. You have to remember that the, the tradition of the church tells us that they were created not only genetically perfect, so they were not just physically and mentally perfect, but they were also spiritually created in a very exalted state of holiness. And as we'll see tomorrow, this is very, very important because the natural law should be based on how God created human nature. And one of the problems we have today is that medicine and psychology do not have a clear concept of what is normal. So how do you heal people if you don't know what healthy is? If you look at the arguments that some Catholic intellectuals make to defend homosexuality or transgenderism, they'll point to genetic conditions that are obviously defects. So they're taking something that is a defect and they're saying that that's to be the norm because they've completely lost the concept that God created our first parents perfect and that establishes what is normal. And there's a wonderful saying of one of the desert fathers Avagrius of Pontus, and he said, God commands us to fast, but he doesn't command us to fast all the time because we die. He says, God commands us to keep vigil, but he doesn't command us to keep vigil all the time because we have to sleep sometimes or we'll die. But he says, God does command us to pray without ceasing because the mind was created to pray. So 
When you think of St. Adam and St. Eve, when God created them, all they wanted to do from morning till night was to love God with every thought, with every word, with every action. That is normal. That's normal. That's what God created us to be. So yes, St. Adam and St. Eve were saints. Quite a few people have asked about dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are real. And God created the marine dinosaurs that live in the ocean on the fifth day of creation. And he created the land-dwelling dinosaurs on the sixth day. And the pterodactyls would have been on the fifth day. And yes, Noah had to take every kind of land-dwelling dinosaur on the ark. But the average size of a dinosaur is about the size of a cow. They weren't all like these enormous T-Rexes. And when he did take a T-Rex kind of dinosaur, it would have been juveniles. He wouldn't have take, taken the big ones. After the flood, the environment all over the earth was much more harsh than it was before the flood. So most of the dinosaurs, of course, were destroyed in the flood because the only ones that survived of the land-dwelling ones were the ones that Noah took on the ark. And you can go to Montana if you like. I've been there. The ranchers up there, they're like professional paleontologists because they have these dinosaur graveyards. And typically, you will have land-dwelling dinosaurs buried together with marine creatures that lived in the ocean, and the ocean is a thousand miles away. We'll see tomorrow. There's no way to explain that except with the global flood. But the dinosaurs that were taken on the ark, um, after, the after the ark landed and the waters receded, it was much more difficult for them to survive. And any of those creatures that were a threat to livestock or to human beings, well then, they were usually hunted down. And the person who could take them out, like St. George, the dinosaur slayer, or Beowulf, for example, of course, those people were heroes. These are not fairy tales. If you read Beowulf, you'll see that Grendel is described like a T-Rex. And Beowulf is based on people that we know were real historical people. So how does Beowulf kill Grendel? She has these enormous jaws that can kill a man. So he gets in close and rips one of her little arms out of its socket. And she goes off and bleeds to death. The word dinosaur was not coined until around 1830 by Sir Richard Owen, no relative of mine as far as I know. But prior to that, they, in English, they were called dragons. Dragons are not fairy tales. Dinosaurs and humans have interacted from the beginning, and it is very possible that there are still living dinosaurs in some very remote areas. On our website, we have an article about um, the pterodactyl that, well, it's about pterosaurs in general, but in Papua New Guinea, it is almost certain that there are still surviving pterosaurs because the uh, environment is very remote, and yet many, many very reliable witnesses have seen these, these creatures. Um, so yes, dinosaurs and humans live together on Earth. And one of the main research projects that our scientists have done is to collect dinosaur bones from many different locations and to then send them to laboratories that can do carbon-14 dating. As you know, carbon-14 is found in all living things it's formed in the atmosphere when usually cos cosmic rays come into the atmosphere. They collide with nitrogen atoms. 
They turn them into carbon-14 atoms, and all living things contain carbon. Most of the carbon is carbon-12, which is the stable form of carbon. But for every trillion atoms of carbon-12 in your body right now, you have one atom of carbon-14. When a plant, animal, or human dies, the carbon-14 starts to turn back into nitrogen-14, and it happens very fast. The half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years, which means after 50 to 100,000 years, there will not be one single atom of carbon-14 left in the remains of that plant, animal, or human being. So if dinosaurs became extinct 65 million years ago, then of course there won't be any carbon-14 in any dinosaur bone. Right? Wrong. Because every single dinosaur bone that we collected, and some of them we excavated ourselves, every single dinosaur bone contained substantial amounts of carbon-14. We sent them to laboratories where they have a machine called an accelerated mass spectrometer that can count the number of carbon-14 and carbon-12 atoms in the sample. That's how precise they are. And every dinosaur bone had a substantial amount of carbon-14. The dates that we got from the laboratory were from 20 to 30,000 years before the present. Now you may say, that's completely out of the evolution ballpark, but it doesn't exactly seem to fit within the traditional biblical framework that the church always accepted, but it does. And the reason is that we know that the Earth's magnetic field is decaying exponentially. Scientists have been measuring the strength of the Earth's magnetic field for 200 years. So if you go back to the time of the flood about 4,500 years ago, the Earth's magnetic field would have been so strong that those cosmic rays would have had great difficulty penetrating the atmosphere and turning the nitrogen-14 into carbon-14, which means, logically, the farther back you go, the more you have to shorten those dates to take that into account. So the 20 to 30,000 year dates that we get for the dinosaur bones from five different world-class laboratories logically should be reduced down to four to 5,000 years, which is right within the biblical framework. And then um, one other question was about aliens, extraterrestrials. And very quickly, um, the teaching of the church is clear that there are angels, there are humans, and then there are corporeal creatures on earth. There are no rational corporeal creatures anywhere else in the universe. And it's very, very shocking that many very highly educated Catholic intellectuals, both natural scientists and theologians, are saying that rational corporeal creatures must have evolved in other parts of the universe. And that's not a problem for us because if they did, then either God would have tested them the way that he tested St. Adam and St. Eve, and if they passed the test, great. And if they flunked the test the way our first parents did, well then, our Lord would have become a Planet X person to redeem them. Well, this is a blasphemy and it's against the faith because it's a dogma of the faith that our Lord Jesus Christ had two natures. He had a divine nature and he had a human nature. He did not have a planet X nature or a planet Y nature. So it is absolutely impossible for there to be any other corporeal, rational creature anywhere else in the universe because if God tested them and they passed the test and they didn't fall into sin, they still suffered the punishment the, the judgment on the whole universe at the time of the original sin on earth. And that would make God unjust because according to their hypothesis, these extraterrestrials have no biological relationship with human beings. 
Now, the other thing I have to tell you is uh, there are researchers who have thoroughly studied all the evidence for UFOs and extraterrestrials, and one of them is uh, Gary Bates, one of the, our separated brethren at Creation Ministries International. And he'll tell you that he works closely with a man who used to be very big into this uh, ET movement and, and people who had had encounters with extraterrestrials, which were, the, and these were people who were honest and they believed, they described these encounters with what seemed like aliens. Every single one of these encounters turns out to be diabolical. And he records instances where, for example, there was, there was a man who was lying in bed, and all of a sudden, the roof of his house seemed to open up, and he saw a spaceship, and then a beam of light came down, and he felt himself being pulled up. And he said the name of Jesus, and the whole thing disappeared. And one of his associates has apparently got 400 sworn testimonies from people who were having these encounters with what they thought were UFOs, and when they invoked the name of Jesus, the whole thing stopped. So yes, they're real, but they're demonic. They're not extraterrestrial, rational, corporeal creatures. Sometimes people ask me that question, and I say, if you actually look at the structure of those experiences, they're not any different than the types of diabolic attacks that people describe who are possessed. So um, not, I'm not suggesting that they all are. Uh, how, do you, how does the spiritual warfare component factor in the era of evolution in science? In the solemn rite of exorcism, there's a certain point where you get to the prayers where you're commanding um, the demons to do certain things, but one of the part of that is you st there's a series of labels in relationship to Satan. So like, for example, in Cider of Incest, um, there's, there's just a number of them, but one of them is um, Dr. Hereticorum, which is the teacher of heretics. And so even though I tend to address when I'm dealing with evolution, I tend to address it primarily from a philosophical point of view, um, it, the that's just because that's my forte. It doesn't exclude the fact that I think that, the, that this thing is entirely diabolic in the sense of it just being such a cornerstone to such a broader set of uh, theological errors, um, well, to modernism itself. And so I think in that sense, it actually it does have a spiritual component to it. I think also it's one of those things that it's uh, on a spiritual level once they can get people destabilized in relationship to the truth, and once they can get people to basically reject the Catholic faith on a variety of different levels, they're weakened on a spiritual level, and people are much more easy to, be, to prey upon. It also provides the intellectual framework by which they can drive societies and do certain things, which um, if you've watched the series Foundations Restored, you see there are certain societal effects that, that are result from this. You know, and political effects. And so I think that in that sense, there is a, a definite um, uh, spiritual war war warfare component. Um, but I think it's really more a case of the demons. They came up with the idea, but then they're also um, the ones that are motivating people to follow it. Uh, if we naturally devolve, isn't the spread of evolution an attempt to encourage people to embrace corruption as if it's part of God's creation? I chose this question to answer this because I think that's true. I think that's one of the reasons why you'll hear people, even in the church, say you know things like, um, in fact, probably just read it recently. I don't know if it was a bishop. I think it was a bishop, but he basically said, well, you know, the reason um, that you know in the past, if you actually look in Scripture and you look in the past, the history of the church, they never actually understood homosexuality. They never knew what it was. I'm like. Have you ever heard of Sodom and Gomorrah? <laughs> Have you ever read St. Paul? I mean, you can go down the whole litany of 
things, which is just uh, absolutely absurd. He's obviously never read um, the uh, the work by. Um, uh, I'm just wrapping it up now again because I've read it before. But basically, the point being is is that the church has known about this all along. They've known it's it's a, it's a vitia continuatorum, and he was tra- it's he's just trying to get this stuff by. But it's this attitude that, well, these acts are no longer evil, right? It's okay now for divorce to happen because we're evolving. It's okay for these things because human beings are changing. Modern man, I'm going to talk a little bit about this tomorrow, there's this attitude that modern man is just fundamentally different than the generations that went before, and that's just not true. I mean, it, it, it just kind of gets me the elation, that's the technical word for it, the elation after the, after the um, Second World War gave the greatest generation this idea that they were different, that things had changed, that humanity had turned a corner, and that things were wonderful and great, and that, you know, that things just no longer apply. We didn't need the disciplines. We didn't need all this stuff. And you're just like, excuse me, you just walked out of a war where tens of millions of people were wiped out. Russia just got done wiping out 20 million people in the Ukraine. You just got, and you just go down the litany last century was the century of death. And you're telling me that somehow modern man is better and that we don't need to be doing all these things? That's just absurd on the face of it, right? So there is this shift, but it's all because of this. Again, things are always progressing for the better. And this this idea that somehow or another our generation is more superior and better than the others, and that's just simply not true. But in the process of that, it also meant that the, the church didn't have to have these disciplines anymore. The church didn't have to condemn homosexuality or fornication or adultery or divorce and all these things. The church didn't have to do these things because man is changing, and that's why homosexual, homosexual marriage is acceptable, because man is changing. No, he's not. Human nature doesn't change. The essence of human nature does not change. So uh, to answer your question, yeah, I think evolution... Uh, part of it's the Hegelian dialectic, which, which also undergirds evolution, but it is evolution that's in the minds of these people, or at least being used to uh, to p- push this stuff forward. And this is why you'll hear them say things, well, well we, we can never go back. Well, it's not a matter of going back. It's just a matter of embracing what's being handed to you by the entire tradition of the church, right? So anyway, that being said, you can stand here for a while and yammer about that. All right. What is your opinion on technology and IA? Well, technology in and of itself is a good. It would be, it'd be, it's, a, it's a useful good, as St. Thomas says. So there's three kinds of good. There's the useful good, but then there's also the truly good and then um, the apparent good. But the point being is, is that it can be a useful good. The point, it, as a useful good, it can actually be wonderful. I mean, you can just see that by virtue of the fact that we can stream stuff about evolution on the Internet, right? I don't know how long the government's going to let us do that, but you know how it is. All right. So technology in and of itself is a good. It's the use of it that becomes a problem in two ways. One is that because it's a good, we get a certain pleasure out of its use, and so that has to be moderated through um, uh a, and the amount that you use it, but then also when you use it, you have to do things to um, f- to overcome the intemperance that it can actually be get. Um, and then AI, artificial intelligence. You know, I think that there's a there's some errors kind of floating around in relationship to um, most people's perception of it because it's how it's being presented. But AI is still just basic, it's, it's still programming. It's just based on probabilities and it does a series of things and it, it looks at a series of things and then rules out certain things so that you end up coming to what is the, the proper conclusion. But it's still the programming that determines how it's going to assess those probabilities. So in the end, it's what the human beings determine in the programming and then you have the other thing of garbage in, garbage out. It still applies. So. If the programming is done in such a way where it restricts the input into the thing so that the only thing that can come out the other end are woke answers, which we're seeing on some of these things, that like if you use chat, GBT, that's actually what you're going to get is a bunch of woke stuff because it's been programmed into it. So AI of itself can be a good thing as long as it's restricted to certain things, it's kept within a certain uh, set of parameters, and the programming is done right, etc., but um, I'm a fr- but it can also be used for evil, right? So people can use it to 
promote all sorts of, uh, I mean, if you program an AI program to actually come up with the best possible diabolic curses, well, it's probably going to turn out some pretty good stuff over the course of time, right? Okay. So the point being is it's like any other form of technology. I do think it, there has to be some ethics rules and certain things imposed in relationship to its use, but do you think this was given to us by demons? I don't. If you actually look at AI and its development, what they did is they just modeled it against the human brain. So they look at how the human brain basically makes associations and they basically taught the, uh, taught, but they programmed the computers to be able to, based on probabilities of how certain things would outcome, but then also, you know, by giving it basic data, what the connections of things were. And so it, it basically functions like a human brain or any other kind of brain, technically. So it's, it basically functions like a, develop, a, a restricted but a developed form of what's called the cogitative power, which is part of the brain's ability to make associations. So it's basically they're just training it to do that. So I don't think it's demonic in and of itself. It doesn't mean that it can't devolve into that depending on what human beings do with it. So. Someone asked about the statement of uh, Pope St. John Paul II when uh, he's alleged to have said in 1996 that uh, evolution is more than a hypothesis. There's actually a lot more <laughs> to that story. And we know for a fact that uh, the Holy Father actually never gave that address. And the theologian who wrote the speech that wasn't given, but which was reported in the mass media, uh, did not get it approved by the theologian of the papal household. However, we would not deny that Pope St. John Paul II basically agreed with what the speech said, but the fact that it was presented to the world as something that he actually did say tells you something about the interest that the mass media has in promoting evolution and in giving the impression that it's perfectly acceptable to Catholics. Now, you have to understand that when Vatican I defined papal infallibility, the Council Fathers defined it very precisely. They specifically say that this gift of infallibility is not given to the Pope to define any new doctrine but only to define a doctrine of faith or morals that is contained in the deposit of faith that was handed down from the apostles. And you can look at all the statements of Pope St. John Paul II favorable to the evolutionary hypothesis or any other recent pope. You will not find one where they find molecules to man evolution or a microbe to man evolution in the deposit of faith. That's number one. Any statement that they made favorable to evolution was made of it as a hypothesis in natural science. And popes are not infallible when they give their opinions about hypotheses in natural science. Pope Francis believes that human activity ca is causing global warming. Well, that's a hypothesis in natural science. If you study and you discover, for example, that there was substantial global warming in the Middle Ages when no one was driving SUVs or burning coal in coal plants, then you're being a good son of the church or daughter of the church if you respectfully show the church leadership that the evidence simply doesn't support this hypothesis. That's not being disobedient because the Pope is merely giving an opinion about something in the realm of natural science. Now, if you look at what Pope Pius XII in Humani Generis and Pope St. John Paul II wrote when they were writing in the realm of theology and philosophy, you'll find that they actually asked us to do things which, if we obeyed them, would lead to the complete rejection of the molecules to man evolution hypothesis. Because in Humani Generis, uh, Pope Pius XII 
asked that Catholic theologians and philosophers apply the traditional prin metaphysical principles of Catholic philosophy to the examination of the evolutionary hypothesis. And in Fides et Ratio, Pope St. John Paul II made the same appeal. Well, Father Ribberger has proved to you that when you obey Pope St. John Paul II in Fides et Ratio, and you apply these principles to the evolutionary hypothesis, it flunks the test. So Pope St. John Paul II, in his more authoritative teaching, gives us the guidelines, which if we follow them, will lead to the rejection of the evolutionary hypothesis. Now, the other uh, point that's important to make is that we cannot fault the popes if all of the scientists in the Pontifical Academy of Sciences are telling him that evolution is a sound hypothesis. And you have to understand that because the Pontifical Academy of Sciences has become like a self-selecting body, and they all believe in evolution, they're only selecting people for membership who hold to this view. And they are not only 100% in favor of evolution, I mean the molecules to man evolution hypothesis, they're totally in favor of brain death as the criterion for human death. They're in favor of GMO food as the solution to the problem of hunger in the third world. And they're all in favor of limiting family size to one or two children. This is absolutely absurd. But this is because they have all accepted this false evolutionary framework. Now, the other thing that's important to understand is that these scientists can point to phenomena that seem to support their view. I'll give you an example. There's um, a kind of lizard in Puerto Rico uh, called the crested anole. And the scientists were amazed because the environment where they live changed very rapidly to an urban environment from being a natural environment. And lo and behold, in just a few generations, these lizards grew much longer legs and sprouted little appendages on their limbs so that they could climb walls, whereas before they were normally climbing trees. So of course you had scientists saying, this is evolution in action. Look, look at this happening before our eyes. And if something like that were shown to the Pope, unless he has knowledge of genetics and biology beyond the average person, that could be very impressive. But what you have to understand is, when the scientists looked at what was happening to these lizards at the genetic level, there were over 30 different genes that were activated that were resulting in the longer limbs and these appendages that allowed them to climb on walls in urban areas. Clearly, God wrote the programming into their genome. And the irony is that the consensus view among biologists from the 1970s to the 1990s was that the DNA in our bodies that does not code for protein was junk, left over from the millions of years of evolution. And since only 2% of our DNA tells little molecular machines and our cells how to put amino acids together to make proteins, which are the building blocks of our bodies, that meant that about 98% of our DNA was just a useless holdover from the millions of years of evolution. Well, that was a little bit much, even for some of the evolutionists, to think that 98% of our DNA was junk. And so finally, they got funding for Project ENCODE to study the so-called junk DNA. And of course, they find, found out that it's not junk after all. In fact, the, the so-called junk DNA operates at a higher level than the DNA that codes for protein. It switches on and off different genetic mechanisms. And so what happened with these lizards is God had written into the genome of the original 
lizard ancestors of these crested anoles in Puerto Rico the potential to adapt to different kinds of environments. And so when the environment changes, it's not that the environment has a mind <laughs> and changes the lizard, but the God has designed the creatures so that certain triggers will activate these genetic programs. And that's why in a very short span of just a few generations, you could see these new features appearing. But it has nothing to do with evolution because all the information for those features was programmed into the genome of that organism from the beginning. And finally, um, we were asked about the Big Bang hypothesis. And I would encourage you to go to the Colby Center website, www.colbaycenter.org, and read the article by Dr. Thomas Seiler, who has a PhD in physics from the Technical University of Munich, and see his critique of the uh, Big Bang hypothesis. And as Father Ripperger mentioned, the Big Bang hypothesis is so contradictory now to observed evidence that according to the standard model, 95% of the matter in the universe cannot be seen, cannot be observed, and nobody knows what it is. It's, it's dark energy and dark matter. Now, that is not science. When 95% of what you can actually measure and observe is, is not part of what supports your hypothesis, it's, it's time for a new hypothesis. And Dr. Seiler shows for example, that even the most ardent Big Bang cosmologists admit that they cannot explain how stars came into existence. What students are told is that gas particles somehow condensed to form the first stars. But this goes against the reality of the physical nature of things because gravity is much weaker than gas pressure. So before gas particles ever condense to form the nucleus of a star by gravity, gas pressure is going to drive them apart. So the only realistic accounts of star formation that the Big Bang cosmologists can offer are scenarios where, for example, a star explodes and it creates these certain special conditions where a star could form. But that doesn't tell you how the first stars came into existence. So the best explanation for how the first stars came into ex existence is in the sacred history of Genesis, where Moses says, and he made the stars also. <laughs> Okay, it's 10 o'clock, so we have to um, end for tonight. We hope everybody comes back tomorrow. Remember, start time registration at 10, um, but you can get in here any time up until 11 or after, but 11 o'clock is the new start time, okay? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. We should have a um, final blessing, my father. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti Supervos et Maniat Semper. Amen.